a 1 1 split in the Tampa runnings of the games and for Kevin Cash in his seventh season as Ray skipper three straight postseason appearances the Rays are the first team other than the Yankees to lead the American League in wins in back to back seasons since the Indians of the mid 90s and for Alex Cora among all skippers with at least 15 playoff games managed Cora's winning percentage is the best in MLB history 13 wins four losses in his postseason career. Native Aldi on the mound for Boston. Let's get a look at the Tampa Bay Rays. Geico starting lineup for game three. Lau, Franco, and Meadows will lead things off. Tampa Bay used more lineup combinations than any other team in the game this year and a new look for game three. Nelly Cruz, the seven time All Star, right in the middle of it at DH. Choi and Rosa Rain to follow. Randy Rosa Rain, a 10 for 28, went batting sixth in the lineup this year. Kiermaier, Zanino, and Wendell. Round things out for the race and for 31 year old right hander Nate Evaldi his last appearance is a large part of the reason why Boston has survived to go this far Tuesday in the wild card game against the Yankees pitched into the sixth inning about just one earned run on a solo homer struck out eight did not walk a batter. Well he's going to attack you Matty he's going to be able to throw his fastball cutter curveball slider split he's got every angle covered he's got every runway against the right and left handed hitters. And you know the one thing he does he throws a lot of strikes so this is going to be the execution of the power hitting Rays against the power pitching Nathan Evaldi. Today's first pitch is presented by Sirius XM. Who can stay off the high fastball today will be the team that I think has the best chance of being successful successful and what I mean about the high fastball I mean the one above the strike zone where both pitchers like to pitch and a lot of these hitters like to swing game three is underway Lau Franco and Meadows here for the Rays. Lau looking for his first hit this postseason 0 for 8 with three strikeouts. He has a bit of a feast or famine postseason history dating back to last year's Rays run. And it's a ball and a strike. No secrets between Nate Valdi's repertoire and what the Rays are looking for today. Four regular season starts against Tampa. And if Aldi pitched well in all four of them, two wins and a loss at 2.39 ERA, and he's quickly in front of Brandon Lau. You can definitely see he's uh, revved up. That's a split finger fastball. The previous pitch were fastballs. There's going to be a lot of grunting done by Nathan Evaldi today. One, two. Took something off and struck out loud. One gone. Well, the arsenal for this young man has been incredible since coming back from two Tommy John surgeries. You see the fastball that comes in, 97 to 100 miles an hour. Got the curveball, slider, splitter, and cutter. That last pitch being the split finger fastball. So when you can elevate up and you can throw this split that looks like it's going to hold its plane and then disappear, that's what the Ray hitters are trying to stay off of. And uh, good luck if he's on his game because. The one thing he does is throws a lot of strikes, so you got to be on attack if you're a hitter. The switch hitting shortstop Wander Franco now. Hurt. He does throw a lot of strikes. In fact, Nate Evaldi led all major leaguers as 55% of what he threw landed in the strike zone. We're not talking about swinging strikes, pitches in the zone, and nobody threw a higher percentage than Evaldi. Franco sends one out to right center field a one out base hit in the Tampa half of the first. Well the Rays really doesn't matter who they face 241 243 other splits against rights and left but I really think they they fare better against right handed pitchers maybe not a right handed pitcher like Nathan Evaldi but they get some left handed thump that they can put in their lineup and of course Franco being a switch hitter. The question will be whether or not they Nathan neutralized the right handed power like Rosarena and Cruz. Those to me are the two issues for the Rays. If they can get something out of their right handed hitters today they'll be in good shape. 
Rogers one of Tampa's leading power threats a left handed hitting left fielder Austin Meadows 27 homers during the regular season over 100 runs driven in. Meadows is a guy to keep an eye on today if only because he has the best track record against Nate Valdi of any of Kevin Cash's hitters seven for twenty one with a homer. There's a drive well hit out to right field Renfro back on it and it's gone and just like that it's two nothing Tampa. Keep an eye on him indeed. Well, that's important for the Rays because they got a young pitcher on the mound that could use some cushion. Only about 40 innings or so that he's had with the Rays this year and this early lead being on the road after really getting thumped yesterday goes a long way. Aggressive hitting team against aggressive pitcher. And the Rays got off to a Quick start. Scoring first has been a harbinger of good things to come this postseason. Teams that score first are eight and two oh, so up. far. And Austin Meadows gets the raise on the board first today. I mean, center cut, and you got to hit it a lot further to right field than you do left field. And that one's yanked foul. Counts a ball and a strike to Nelson Cruz. He just gets a flat bat through the zone and uses the power of Nathan Baldy. This is what the Rays do. They hit homers. They run. They pretty much do it all. That's why they won 100 games. It's hard to explain how they can turn their roster over and do this. Well, already more damage in a third of an inning against Nathan Baldy by the Rays than what the New York Yankees were able to muster in five and a third Tuesday night in the wild card game. Ball and two strikes to the seven time All Star and a swinging strike three. That's two punch outs for Ivaldi. The Rays early on in the season had a pretty alarming strikeout rate, but every month it got pretty much shaved down and they've done a nice job at least controlling that high rate of strikeouts. Part of it might be the influence of Cruz settling in. But they've had much better at bats of late, even though today they're facing a high strikeout type pitcher. Here's the left handed hitting first baseman, G Man Choi. Choi homered in game two in Tampa. Well, I think, I think you said it. I mean, it's in the Rays DNA. They don't have a, a very good contact rate. In fact, it's the lowest in the American League, but. They don't really care because they hit the ball out of the ballpark. Almost 41 percent of their hits are for extra bases, and that's the highest percentage in the game. That's the trouble pitch. Watched a lot of matchups. Uh, Choi really struggles with the curveball. Struck out eight times against Nathan Avaldi. He might try to rev a fastball up, but really not any reason to change. The 0-2 to Joy. Able to play off the 99 mile an hour fastball up top. And the reason to do that is you just reset the eyes of Troy, who's seen two breaking balls that he hasn't been able to stay back. And go right back to the breaking ball right here. Little two-strike momentum from the crowd. And a ball in two and two now, rather, to G Man Choi. For Tampa Bay now nine of their 13 runs in the series have come via the homer and Austin Meadows the latest to strike a swing and a miss three strikeouts but it's a trade the Rays will gladly make because they get two runs Austin Meadows hit 27 of them during the regular season his two run shot this afternoon gets the Rays off to a high flying start. Well, for 26 year old Drew Rasmussen making his first ever postseason start today and doing it on the road against a very difficult lineup, 
what better circumstance to make it than with a two run lead after just a half inning of work. And his first postseason start offering is in for a strike to Kyle Schwarber. Last Wednesday was his last start at Houston. It was a good one. Five shutout innings. In fact it looked a lot like his last start here in this ballpark which came against the Red Sox September 7th allowed one run over five innings. Not a big strikeout guy but Rasmussen has been terrific in a starter's capacity for the Rays. Kyle Schwarber greets him with a high drive toward the monster. And so it's going to be one of those days. Six batters to start the game already two homers. The first leadoff batter to homer by a Boston Red Sox player in the postseason since Dustin Pedroia in game one of the 2007 World Series. Here's Kike Hernandez who was a big problem on Friday with four extra base hits. So here's part of the intrigue for the race. Dynamic arms, not a lot of experience though in the front three starters they put out here in the postseason. Hernandez sends a ball to the monster. And this one's off the wall for Meadows to gather in. And Kike's held to a very loud single. Basically a two pitch pitcher and the slider is going to have to be huge. The slider was not a very good pitch that Schwarber was able to hit. It pops out of his arm or his hand and you see how it just rotates in the middle of the part of the plate and he takes it to the shorter part of the park where that monster has made these Red Sox a monster at home and you talked about it, how many runs they score at home. Two pitch pitcher is OK if you hit all your spots and you make the pitches you have to make but it's not OK against a lineup like this when they are feasting on fastballs. And here's Rafi Devers now. Her. Kike Hernandez by the way channeling his inner Billy Hatcher. That's five straight plate appearances with a hit this postseason for Kike. He's at first a run in on the Schwarber homer. Oh, and one to the All Star third baseman Rafi Devers. Hurt. Oh, and two. Now, this two strike pitch should be above the strike zone. They've got to get the ball up to Devers. We'll kind of talk about it throughout the game as Devers has struggled with the pitches up, especially with that bottom hand. Any pitch in the middle or down to the zone he's hitting, anything above is not been hit so far in this series. Well at the very least and, and that's exactly what you described there's no no use no sense in giving in to a secondary pitch for a strike because Devers will wear you out when you make such a mistake and we know that a lot of opponents tried to fastball them to death during the regular season including the Houston Astros who at one point threw him 50 straight fastballs in a four game series. Well this is what I'm talking about he's been dealing with an injury and he's playing through it and it's been a struggle for him when they throw the ball up now I get it, it's a left handed pitcher but you're seeing the follow through where the bottom hand awkwardly comes off the bat and that usually doesn't work out very well so at the top of the zone he has not made contact and hasn't had any success and then when they've made a mistake down great catch by Kiermaier he's had an opportunity to put the bat on the ball. Got him looking that time. First out of the game for Rasmussen. The action so fast in the bottom of the first, we haven't even set the rest of the Boston lineup. A look at Alex Cora's Geico Red Sox starting lineup for game three. We've seen the first three hitters. Bogarts is next. Huge postseason numbers after kind of grinding out a bad finish to the regular season. 
Verdugo and Martinez, five and six. Hunter Renfro, Kevin Ploiecki, who has turned into the personal catcher for Nate Valdi, and Christian Arroyo round things out for the Red Sox. Now here's a guy that doesn't chase much, loves the ball middle, belt up. And he will make you pay if you make a mistake up with a fastball. Great fastball hitter and good two strike hitter. Xander Bogarts hit a two run homer against Garrett Cole that really set the tone for Boston on Tuesday night in the wild card game. In fact, homered in two of his first three postseason games this year. Guy just always reminds me when he's hitting like nothing in a hurry swinging underwater but with tremendous power. Good slider that time swung on a missed. That pitch right there has to be perfect for this young man to navigate through this lineup which sometimes a day off cools you off. It doesn't look like it's cooled him off much with the 20 hits they had in Tampa but. His fastball command is what's going to be his strength and that fastball command is on the outside part of the plate which we talk about pitchers have a glove side command or arm side command his glove side command is really good. Pitching against a guy really good at two strike counts one and two to Bogarts now and I guess it's a it's an example of what you talk about John being able to slow the game down Bogarts in this series alone has three of his six hits in two strike counts this year. He's just rarely off balance and it's just a credit to him and trusting and knowing the strike zone trusting his hands and obviously having great mechanics at the plate. So it ranks among franchise greats and postseason starts at his position. He's back to an even two and two count now. Was really the top of the Red Sox lineup that did all the damage Friday in game two. There's some of the two strike numbers that we talk about. Well above league average. A run in on the Schwarber Homer. Hernandez at first with one gun. Well, in this ballpark, if there's one side of the plate you want to have command, it's the side he does because you want right handers hitting the right field where there's a lot more space in center field. You don't want him playing pepper of that left field wall, and you want left handers to pull the ball. So you really do as a pitcher. Now, he's a young pitcher and doesn't have much experience here, and you don't want the hitters to feel comfortable and play what we call pepper off that wall and use that wall to their advantage, which the Red Sox do so well. Serves that just foul in right. And this is the heat map where you see most of the pitches that Drew Rasmussen, again, not a ton of innings pitched this year, but he loves throwing the ball on that outside part of the plate. Now, the Rays in general, because they have so many dynamic arms, they don't really preach that, but he's the one guy talking to Kevin Cash that can actually dot up his fastball. Now, the tension of a playoff game might take that accuracy off just a little bit and understandably so heat map shows you that Rasmussen likes his slider and four of his last five pitches here to Bogarts have been sliders. Well here's the arsenal it's really two pitch mix they got four but you can see the curveball and change up less than five percent if you add them up and that's the one thing at ninety seven miles an hour his his fastball is pretty straight and so you have to be able to locate it if it's pretty straight has late life. But it's a slider that is going to be the key for today's game. That 65% four seam fastball usage, by the way, is the ninth highest figure in all of baseball. Well, he'd like to put that fastball slider combination to work here to get a ground ball and get him out of a dicey start to the day. Was in front of Bogarts 0 and 2. Here's the 2 2 home, and Xander sends a fly ball into the infield. Brandon Lau is under it, and that's the second out of the inning. Remember that pitch, and I know that Bogarts will remember that pitch. That was a huge mistake, and if he faces him again, that mistake will be 
to Bogart's favor. Watch where this pitch is. It just right center cut. He gets the barrel of the bat just underneath it. You could tell he wanted to eat his bat right there. <laughs> That was one you don't get too often and that's one he doesn't miss too often. So he went five out of six pitches sliders to try to finish him off there. And here's a guy that you have to be aware of on the first pitch because Alex Verdugo has offered at the first pitch in seven of his nine plate appearances this series. Oh it's inside. He takes a fastball. You know it's amazing John how the postseason has made the Boston lineup even scarier and, and by that I mean this was a team that had some swing and miss in it. They chased a lot during the regular season third highest chase percentage in the sport. It's been different in the postseason and Verdugo is a great example. He's taken 21 swings in the postseason. One whiff. Yeah he looks locked in and when a guy looks locked in. It usually tells you as a starting pitcher or a relief pitcher you're going to have to make great pitches because he's not jumpy. He's waiting as long as he has to and then when he makes contact seems like to be a line drive. 2 0. On a knuckling hop out to Franco to retire the side. Boston counter punches however one comes right back on the Kyle Schwarber Homer his second of the postseason. On to inning number two. It's two to one, Tampa. Two to one, Tampa. As Randy Arozarena leads things off in the race half of the second, he's followed by Kevin Kiermeyer and Mike Zanino. The American League Division Series is brought to you by Good Sam Rentals, Travel America with Good Sam, and by Good Sam RV Parks, America's largest campground network. And this MLB Network telecast is presented by Geico. Happy Geico Ween. Switch to Geico for more ways to save. Mistake there. If you're going to neutralize a Rosarena, somebody has to be able to pound him in. They tried to go in right there and left over the middle. You get him to think inside with his fastball, you're going to have success against him. And Nathan Evaldi's had success against him in his career. And a Rosarena waves and misses. All four outs for Evaldi via the strikeout. Well, Nate Evaldi and Drew Rasmussen at first glance wouldn't appear to have a whole lot in common. They do share one very important part of their background, and we go to Ken Rosenthal for more on that. That's right, Matt, and this is actually something of a historic occasion today. Both of these pitchers each had two Tommy John surgeries. It's the first ever matchup of a postseason game between such pitchers. We had one earlier this season, the first one ever in the regular season. That was between Evaldi and Jamison Tyone. Now, Evaldi had his first Tommy John in 2007. He was in high school then. His second was in 2016. Rasmussen's were much closer together. His first in March 2016, toward the end of his sophomore year at Oregon oh. State. His second in September 2017. So, a lot of good medicine has taken place, good rehabilitation, and here we are. Two pitchers who each underwent two Tommy Johns. Yeah, I know you could almost qualify Valdi for two and a half. I mean, could you imagine, John, you went through Tommy yeah. John and the subsequent rehab. Could you have ever imagined doing it twice and no. still getting out there? No, and the disclaimer I'd like to follow up with what Kenny said is that, that there's a reason it's a first. There's this just doesn't happen very often, and one's not a guarantee. So Getting Tommy John, although we've seen success rates happen, you don't hear about the ones that don't happen yeah. and they don't come back. So it's never a good thing, but thankfully we have that surgery and thankfully a lot of players have benefited, including myself. But two is that's a long shot, and these guys survived it. Well, look, Kiermeyer's aboard. By the way, uh, the reason I paused just a little bit to our left, one of the greatest plays by the fan on that foul ball was made. And uh, I'm still looking at, like, maybe they're going to sign him. It's well, a great play. I thought maybe the uh, end of the Lions Vikings game oh, was no, under review no. and you yeah. wanted to take another look. <laughs> no, my man made a great play. Might be able to see it here. A little one hand, little bam. That's it. Right in. Who needs a glove, dude? Impressive. He saved the guy with the onion rings behind it from taking it in the chops. 
So one on one out after the Kiermaier base on balls. That's the first postseason walk by Nate Evaldi in six and two third innings. And here's Mike Zanino, a home run threat, 33 of them a career best during the regular season. <laughs> Mike Zanino, uh, of course, making the All Star team. What an incredible tribute for him and the years he's put in. But you mentioned it. I mean, he gets more extra base hits than he's gotten singles on the year. And his power numbers have benefited, but he's a swing and a miss or extra base hit machine. It's a nice play by Kyle Schwarber, by the way. Still kind of growing into the position at first base by everyone's admission. And there's a bell ringer for Kevin Plawek. That's catcher on catcher crime. 0 and 1 to Zanino. I mean, this this is amazing. Uh, you see the names above them. I think everybody recognizes those. But 45.8%. At 72 hits, 33 of them homers. Yeah. He has not really enjoyed his time against Nate Evaldi head to head. One for nine. The one was a homer, but there are five strikeouts <laughs> yeah, there. That's a, it fits the uh, scouting report. And he wants the ball uh, really much on the lower third of the zone because the swing. Taylor made to obviously lift it in the air. The outs are going to be away and up above. So he has three or four areas to go to here with two strikes to give him a swing and miss. Baldy's already struck out four. I would imagine, John, for a hitter, it it would be hard to cancel things out when you're facing Nate Evaldi. He's the only pitcher in baseball that throws five pitches and has a usage of over 10 yeah. percent on all five. So he can go to anything. No, he can. He has every every quadrant covered, and that's that's a beautiful thing if you're a pitcher. Not so much if you're a hitter, because now you have to literally, you know, you're going to get strikes, but you don't know which strikes you're getting. You don't know if it's coming out of his hand as a fastball, a split. The curveball is a much improved pitch that slows down the hitter and then he can speed him up with the velocity up at upwards of 97 and above. So he just had a good feel for the strike zone and uh, for his secondary pitches. Foul tip. And it's still the ball and two strikes on Mike Zanino. And he's just so strong from his legs. I mean. That's where he's generating. He's got a freakish arm. But I believe his favorite pitcher is Nolan Ryan. You can see why. And he's built a lot like Nolan Ryan. Same hometown. Mm -hmm. Alvin, Texas. And Zanino pops it foul. Still the ball and two strikes. Well the Red Sox didn't think they needed to have a, a contingency plan today on the case of a short start though it's in the back of every manager's mind in a postseason series. The Red Sox have announced Nick Pavetta as a game four starter tomorrow. But Pavetta would be available and in line to come in early if needed today. Zanino doing a nice job to hang around in a two strike count here. He sure is. This should be a slider right here. Any kind of uh, pitch on that same height of the, of the zone right now. This 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 would finish Zanino if he if he executes the pitch. If he chooses to go there. But you can see pitch by pitch what he's been able to do and extend this at bat. One out one on the one two once again fouled away the other direction. Yeah, the slider is the pitch that Nate Evaldi had removed from the repertoire for a while. He was comfortable resetting with that about a year ago. It's been effective for him. Of course, prior to Tuesday's wildcard game, the last time we saw Nate in a postseason game was in six innings of relief in that marathon game three of the 2018 World Series at Dodger Stadium, where he took the loss. He gained the whole team. He sure did. 
spun that off to a multi year contract. Yeah, the Max Muncie homer well into the night in the bottom of the 18th inning. Six innings and three hit ball. So the last two postseason appearances for Nate Valdi have both been great. This at bat has been great, even if the outcome doesn't become a hit. Anytime you can make a, a guy work and, and build that pitch count in one at bat. What is this pitch number nine? Number nine, yeah. Five straight foul balls. Number nine. Number nine. Still going. Because I'll tell you what it does. I mean, to a starting pitcher or any pitcher, you, you just get a little bit frustrated, like, come on, put it in play. Even if you get a hit, let me move on. And you're making pitch after pitch, and you get to see all these pitches if you're Zanino. And as the game progresses and you face him two or three times, you get a better feel for what he's got. I mean, he threw 16 pitches total in the first inning to five hitters. And here's number 10 in this plate appearance to Mike Zanino. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm telling you, this, I don't. Obviously we didn't and don't get to see all the regular season at bats. I can't imagine there's been a regular season at bat where he's done this because it's feast or famine. Yeah. And he's putting in a what I call a playoff at bat that's a little bit different than what his at bat in the season would look like. Got him. Finally Nate Evaldi says it took 11 pitches to strike out Mike Zanino. And that's where a lot of the strikeouts for Zanino comes. 94 coming into this game on elevated pitches since 2019. And he went just above the belt and near the letters after all those pitches down in one area that he was able to get a bat on. I know the scientists tell us that a baseball does not rise on its way to the plate. But boy, it sure looks like that sometimes. Here's Joey Wendell with two gone. Yeah, the angle he throws, he, he's got a lower three-quarter type delivery, and, and because he can get down the mound and his extension from the rubber is so far, it does give the illusion that he's throwing that fastball in an upward motion. Wendell's got some pop, a career high, 11 homers this year. And all star this season in his fourth year with the Rays. Little check in on Kiermeyer, who stole 11 bag, nine bags rather, in 11 attempts during the regular season. Oh, it's inside. One to one to Joey Wendell. Joey Wendell. It's another typical hitter for the Rays. He likes the ball in the strike zone, has struggles with the ball up, and you can crowd him inside like he tried right there. But anything in the zone, he he is uh, he's kind of mastered that. Ball in two strikes. Five outs recorded by Nate Evaldi, all five on swinging strikeouts. There goes Kiermeyer, the one two is swung out and missed. Six K's through only two innings for Nate Evaldi. The Good Sam ALDS telecast on MLB Network presented by Geico continues 2-1 to one, Tampa. A couple of homers, two run shot by Austin Meadows, solo dinger by Kyle Swarber, and six native Aldi strikeouts kind of gives you the cliff notes on the opening to this one. 
J.D. Martinez, a sharp one hopper that eats up Joey Wendell. It's on into left for a base hit. And J.D. a little ginger still with the ankle injury. But boy, oh boy, what a difference he has made in the lineup. A four for five game on Friday with a double and a three run homer. And Ken Rosenthal, this from a guy whose status was really in doubt for the series. Definitely, Matt. And he told me before this game that he was a little sore today in the cooler weather, but he was effusive after game two, giving credit to the Red Sox athletic trainers, their massage therapists, strength coaches, hitting coaches, said they did miracles in helping him get back on the field. Now before that Alex Cora had jokingly told the Red Sox longtime massage therapist Russell Nua you got Kurt Schilling pitching with a bloody sock and you can't get J.D. to play. <laughs> well Nua worked his magic as befitting a man who owns five World Series championship rings one with the Diamondbacks four with the Red Sox. OK. He's fantastic by the way. Yeah. Oh yeah. You've benefited from his handiwork as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, massage therapists can win World Series rings too. And I mean, when you start collecting them in various uniforms, we're going to say your name on TV. Yeah, I'm telling you. The last at bat that JD had, I was so shocked he went for a double double in Tampa that maybe the adrenaline of his fourth hit that night. Oh, but that game was well in hand and that would have been a stop sign if a first base coach can give you stop signs it would have been like stay there. But he went and got. His double and. Red Sox thumped the Rays that night. Lead off hitter aboard lead off hitter is reached in both innings against Erasmus and it was the lead off oh. homer by Schwarber in the first. Five of the first seven hitters for Boston have swung at the first strike they've seen today. So they're picking up right where they left off on Friday John. Yeah and I really thought that would be the game plan just watching some film on Rasmussen he likes to throw his fastball and he loves to throw it in the strike zone outer third. On the ground for Franco. What a feed to Lau. What a double play. They call him the eighth wonder of the world. Tampa's all world shortstop initiating an inning ending six to four to three twin killing. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app, an official betting partner of Major League Baseball. Scan the QR code on your screen now. All right. Brandon Lau leads things off in the visitors half of inning number three two to one Rays top of the order Lau Franco and Meadows. Lau struck out to open the ball game the first of six hosted by Nate Evaldi through two innings yes all six of his outs on swinging strikeouts to start the game. Yeah you did. Lau behind 0 and 2 again. There's not that he. Uh, Trust his defense. He just trusts his arm. I mean, this is like Bingo Long and the Traveling All Stars. Just everybody have a seat. You take a look at the Citrix shift tracks, showing you in real time the defensive positioning. 0 and 2, the count to Brandon Lau. See, the thing that most people may not understand when they're sitting at home going, why do they keep swinging at that split finger? Well, his fastball's so good, you got to be geared up for it. If he had a 90 mile an hour fastball, it'd be a little different deal. You could sit back a little longer, but when the ball comes out of his hands, most of the hitters are hoping to see the spin right away, and you can't see split spin because it tumbles and looks like a fastball. Lau puts it in play. Schwarber. Oh, wonky toss. Yikes. That's going to go down as an error on Kyle Schwarber. As we mentioned earlier, Kyle still learning the position, and uh, he just didn't. He got in between and he got flat footed, and yeah. so he's trying to guide a. Uh, uh, he tried to make a soft toss a little firmer, and as he made it firmer, see that's too long for a toss. To make it firmer, he tried to throw it harder underhand, and what he did is he threw it higher, and so that would have been much easier right now to make a soft toss overhand. And that is something he wishes he could have had over. But you talked about it. They're learning the position. Got to get his bat in the lineup. And an unfortunate play. 
Boston's defensive efficiency one way to measure team defense the lowest in the American League this year and you got Kyle Schwarber who's making just his oh, 11th career start at first base today and, and to a degree Alex Cora had no choice because if he wants J.D. Martinez in the lineup. Yep. He has to DH him. The ankle will not allow him to play the outfield today. And because he was so far away from the base, being flat footed, normally when a first baseman underhands the ball to a pitcher, he's moving towards him. You practice those plays all the time. So you get the ball and you're moving towards the player and the, the pitcher, and you toss the ball as you're moving and you got better feel. He just literally was sitting there, tossed it, and threw it up in the air. Ball in a strike to count to Wander Franco, who singled and scored in front of the Meadows homer in the first inning. That's the first error in the postseason for Boston. Chopper to second, double play ball. Arroyo to Bogarts, relay, not in time. Franco runs too well. Runs all right, and this was a uh, watch the ball in the glove. How little time it spends in Bogarts almost pops out, but he flies down the line. He puts a safe sign right about now. That is near elite sprint speed. Wander Franco got down there in 29.5 feet per second. Anything with a three in front of it is elite, and Franco was pretty close. See that's what I was saying the ball wasn't in his glove almost at all. And could have come out. Oh. So one out one on for Austin Meadows whose two run homer started the scoring this afternoon. We should note with Franco at first base too, John the umpiring crew between innings instructed the grounds crew to dry out the area around the bag. You can see the kind of Different colored oh, surface there. Not saying anything that would have slowed down the Rays a little bit. Red Sox don't run. I'm just, you know, we're fooling conspiracy. around. Conspiracy. But here it is. I mean, it's, you know, they had to attend to it. It was a little wet, and uh, this benefits both sides. They just want the yeah. field in its most playable form. It was it the Cardinals would come into town the 80s Cardinals and right around home plate would be all quagmire <laughs> just try to yeah prevent that speedy team from chopping down on the ball and beating out infield hits you know in terms of postseason history I believe it was the 1948 Indians were the first team to vote a share of the postseason payday to the grounds crew <laughs> because everything was exactly as they liked it. Heads ground keeper here at Fenway is uh, really a legend in the industry David Miller who did wonderful things in Milwaukee's County Stadium for years before coming to Fenway. He is renowned for his. Grass cutting technique design and ability. And Fenway is beautiful every night. I'm digging it, the way they cut it. You know I love cutting grass. I do know that about you. Meadows with a high fly ball. This one won't have enough. Renfro parks under it to make the catch, and Franco's not going to test him. Renfro's one of the best in the business out there in right, and that's out number two. He's got a cannon. Well, Nelson Cruz has been swinging down and off the plate a little more than uh, than used to very comfortable in Minnesota struggled in the transition coming over here first time he had been traded late in his career has made some adjustments lately but he is a force in the lineup for the Rays a great trade to boost their offense and he's looking to try to see if uh, Evaldi can leave one over the middle and then no park holds it. Oh. Yeah, Nelson Cruz hit just 226 in the 55 games he played in with the Rays after being dealt by the Twins. He did homer 13 times. But all but three of those home runs came on the road. And the suggestion was that 
Nelson doesn't really love hitting at the trop. The numbers would certainly bear that out. And there's been a couple players, and one most notably, Adamas. You see the Statcast, powered by Google Cloud, talks to exactly what you're talking about. By venue in 2021, the number of games and the homers. Hard to ignore that. Yeah, I mean, Adamas went over to Milwaukee and started raking right away. Yeah. And he had been talking about how he had a hard time tracking the ball there. The more crowd support behind Nate Evaldi, who's got one of the game's premier sluggers behind a ball and two strikes with a runner on. Oh, that's up. Two and two. Well, just to back that note up, best slugging percentage on the road since 2019. Nelson Cruz. Relatively easy take on the cutter that missed. That's a 98 mile an hour fastball in the heart of the strike zone, and Nelly Cruz couldn't catch up to it. Seven strikeouts for Nate Evaldi through three. Still a one run Tampa lead. Game seven of the 2008 American League Championship Series. Jed Lowry was pinch hitting for Alex Cora, Boston's last hope that year. David Price in relief. A first pitch called strike second pitch a sharp ground ball that ended the series and the Rays survived a memorable ALCS that year. I don't know how he survived that. Another leadoff hitter that reaches base for Boston is Christian Arroyo singles on the first pitch of the at bat. I was going to say I don't know how David Price survived that last minute tackle on the <laughs> pile and got crushed. Look when you when you start a postseason game the the. What you want is you want stressless innings and easy outs. So far, it hasn't been stressless and there hasn't been easy. Uh, the leadoff hitter's gotten off three, gotten on three times now for the Red Sox. And when you're Drew Rasmussen, that's the last thing you want to do, turning this lineup around. He will not be in here very long if he continues to put the first bat batter on base. There's Kyle Swerber. Oh, too hot. Leadoff hitters have reached base successfully for the Red Sox in 11 of the 21 innings that they've played in this series. And that's huge because that that everybody I've said this like a broken record regular season game you get a base hit to lead off the inning the crowd doesn't go crazy they just kind of applaud in a postseason game when a, when somebody gets on base it's like the biggest rally for the crowd because they know the postseason means that much more and so the intensity goes up and therefore your stress goes up. Ball with no strikes. The counts of Kyle Swarber, who opened the bottom oh. of the first with a home run, and now it's two and zero. Oh. You know, and the bad news here for Rasmussen and the Rays is his OPS first time through an order is really good, and he didn't exactly get through the first time today in great shape. Second time through, it raises by about 200 points. Yeah, I, I, I think if you're the race and you're looking at this and you look at this home run first stack has powered by Google Cloud, he launches this up in the air. Might have been an out. Mm, few parks, but it wasn't an out here. And that got the Red Sox going and Yeah, to your point, John. Oh, that ball that Schwarber hit the first is a homer in only four of 30 major league parks. And that's that's among the layers of information that Statcast powered by Google Cloud gives us that we never knew before. We used to guess at that stuff, but yeah. we know with certainty now. Rasmussen behind three balls and a strike leadoff hitter aboard. Schwarber with a rocket into right field. Arroyo around second on his way to third and here come the Red Sox once again with runners at the corners and nobody out. This is another bullet and you're seeing 
Even though he got it on the inner part of the plate, the timing, the foot down, and the barrels way out in front. And if you're the Rays, you got to get somebody going up in the bullpen. You can't let this game get away. And for Rasmussen, who doesn't, like you said, Matty, to strike out a ton of hitters, he's got to try to wiggle out of this with one run. Forget about trying to get out of this with no runs. You just don't want that huge inning to open up early on. The first three innings of this series, I thought, was the key to both teams having a chance to successfully put them in their bullpen kind of winning formula together. The Rays didn't have their bullpen winning formula per se in game two. They did in game one. They're hoping to have those heavy arms be ready to pitch with a lead in about the fifth inning. Kyle Snyder, the pitching coach, taking some time with Rasmussen in part to give these guys a chance to get hot. The lefty, Josh Fleming, the right hander, the hard thrower, Pete Fairbanks. We have not seen Fairbanks in the series yet. The reason this is such an interesting series when you throw out three young starters you got a great gem in, in the first game you saw some nerves in the game two. looks like the same thing here but they don't have a starter for game four for the most part the race looks like it'd be a pen type game you saw the note on Kike Hernandez he's got hits in five straight plate appearances again he's offering aggressively at a first pitch and that one's out of play. Hanley Ramirez has the franchise record for consecutive postseason plate appearances with a hit at six. And that's a mark that Kike can tie here in this at bat. Another guy who has cut his swing and miss down to almost nothing in the postseason. Only one whiff. In three plus games. Oh. One and one. Well, the Rays have put this defense consistently against the Red Sox, and the Red Sox exposed it on three occasions in game two. They just serve balls to the right side of the infield. I don't think Kike can do it as much as some of the other guys can, but certainly playing them to pull. That one's going to get down. Another base hit for Kike Hernandez, and Boston is tied at two. And that's going to be all for Drew Rasmussen. There is no stopping Kike Hernandez. That was a slider that just caught way too much of the plate. And the Rays are going to the bullpen. A team that makes frequent bullpen moves is going there today, perhaps a little earlier than they would have preferred. Enter left hander Josh Fleming and we'll be right back. I can turn anyone into a beach bum. I bring families together for a living. I make memories for people I don't know yet. I know this view is too good not to be shared. I am a verbal host. Reggie Bush used to eat breakfast somewhere else. Then he tried Wendy's breakfast. Now we can't get rid of him. Can you believe this breakfast croissant is only $1.99? Yeah, Reggie. I put the sign up. Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's. With early paycheck, you can get your direct deposit up to two days earlier. That's another reason banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than this. Well, honey, which one are you going to open up first? Yep, even easier than that. Plus, with no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Here's a good Halloween trick. Buy a bunch of Reese's. Uh-huh, there you go. Turn off all the lights in your house. Yeah, yeah. 
And then you just don't answer the door. I'm sorry, Reese's. We've often wondered what keeps the world running. Economics? Algorithms? Magic? Turns out, it's you. Doing your thing. Dreaming dreams. Building new worlds. It's why we built our workspace technology. To help you do your best work and to see what you can become. You're made for bigger things. Big early spot for left-hander Josh Fleming who enters on the Citrix pitching change. Fleming with postseason experience from last year. 25 year old lefty who's looking for a ground ball to help minimize the damage. A run in runners at first and second with nobody out. Yeah this is a tough spot. He has to get Devers out. And you know a reliever comes in the game and he must face three batters. Or get the last out of an inning to not adhere to that rule. Tough jam right here. Schwarber and Hernandez aboard and the first pitch to Devers is bunted foul. Yeah you don't see that very often out of the Red Sox and certainly out of the Rays but based on what Devers has been dealing with I thought that would be a pretty good play for him and then turn the lineup over to some heavy hitting guys behind him. If he sticks this in fair territory it's a base hit. Yeah. Because everybody was back. It's 0 and 1 to Devers. You don't look that from a guy who hit 38 homers during the regular season who can do the kind of damage he does. Oh, that's out. Oh, that was wow. a strike. He just caught it. He, he set up in the wrong spot and he caught it awkwardly. Look where he was set up and he had to reach. Just kind of almost made it look like the ball did go outside the strike zone, but that one looked like that could have been a strike. Fastball cutter, slider. Curveball and change. Plumbers, Plumbing's got all of them. Back up the middle and through. A fourth straight base hit. They're going to wave Schwarber around. Throw to the plates. Too late. Boston takes its first lead of the day. Talked about Devers being able to get to the ball middle to middle down and having a struggle with the ball up. This is right down the middle. He does a nice job keeping both hands on the bat and going right back up the middle. And I'm telling you, the day off didn't hinder the Red Sox whatsoever. They are, I mean, it, it's as impressive two game stretch I've seen, and we're only in the third inning. I mean it was the top of the lineup that did all the damage against Kevin Cash's side on Friday and it's the top of the lineup again today John first three hitters in the Boston card five for six and here's Xander Bogarts now. Schwarber gets a good secondary lead a good athlete even though he had that knee injury doesn't break stride and this crowd. Much like they were against the Yankees, into it from every pitch. Hurt. 0 oh and 2 the count to Xander Bogarts. Hmm. Well, a couple of borderline pitches. One that didn't go Snyder's way, or Fleming's way, rather. And the second that did. Oh. Andrew Kittrich has been up. He'd be ready to go. Either uh, after the end of an inning or if Fleming can get through his requisite three assignments. I mean, they're looking for an out here. Yeah, they got to get an out quickly. Four straight singles in the Boston third. And there's the first out of the inning. Well, that strikeout probably had a lot to do with that one call that they were able to get for a great discipline two strike hitter swinging at an off speed pitch, thinking, okay, it might be in that outer, outer quadrant, and it dips below. 
and this is what would concern you if you're a Rays fan on the deep run that you hope your team can make. That's a lot of innings from 2018 on but they led all of baseball in innings pitched this year by a wide margin. Oh it's inside. Ball and no strikes to Alex Verdugo who's four for ten in the series. And a guy who in a very brief time as a Boston Red Sox has really stepped up in the postseason. He's got five RBIs in this series. Some further context on that in a moment. Five RBIs that is in the postseason as a Boston Red Sox. Mookie Betts left here with a total of four postseason RBIs as a Boston Red Sox. Oh, too much. Three balls and no strikes. Kevin Cash knows he's in some dangerous territory here. And is desperate for a ground ball. Three and one. Fleming back in the count. Verdugo prefers hitting off starters, but he's got the count where he wants it in 3 1. He's just trying to cherry pick a pitch and drive it. There's the ground ball. And Choi has no choice but to get the out of the first base bag. All right, that might not seem like a lot. That could be a game saving pitch and at bat if the Rays stay in this game and win it. Because now. That gives their manager an opportunity to go out and get the right hander and stay within one run if the right hander can do his job. So that was a very big comeback 3 0 to 3 1 round out. Fleming gets through his three hitters, and now the call will go out for Andrew Kittridge against a right handed hitting J.D. Martinez. A big matchup in a one run game when we return right after this. That's half the fun of a new house, seeing what people left behind in the attic. Well, saving on homeowner's insurance with Geico's help was pretty fun, too. Oh, it's a tiny dancer. Well, they left a ton of stuff up here. Well, enjoy your house. Nope. No, thank you. Geico could help you save on homeowners and renters insurance. Introducing the new City Custom Cash Card, a different kind of card that rewards Dan where his spending is trending. Just ask stepping outside his comfort zone, Dan. I don't, I don't know where the hole for this is. Or fourth time streaming that period drama, Dan. You just made me miss your best line, so now I'm gonna have to start it again. Even insisted he didn't need directions, Dan. Okay, I'm not lost, I'm exploring. That said, do you know where I am? From select gas, streaming, travel, and more, earn 5% cash back that automatically adjusts to your top eligible spend category, up to $500 spent each billing cycle. It's a nice truck. Yeah, it's a Chevy Silverado. Check out this multi-flex tailgate. Multi-flex, huh? Wow. Come step. <laughs> Mom, Dad's flexing again. That's not all. You can extend the bed for longer stuff. Is right? he still? He's still flexing. That's right. And it becomes a workspace. You can put your laptop here. I'm sending an imaginary email. Hey, Dad. Hey, look who stopped by Daddy's office. Wait, you work here? The Chevy Silverado with the available multi-flex tailgate. Find new flexibility, find new roads. Chevrolet. I look fly. Yeah, yeah. I look good. Look good. I look good. Feel good. Play good. Gillette Pro Glide. Five blades and a pivoting flex ball to get virtually every hair on the first stroke. Look good, game good. Gillette. <laughs> Thank you. 
Right-hander Andrew Kittredge will try to end what's been a troubling inning for the Tampa Bay Rays. 57 appearances during the regular season. This is his fo first appearance of this postseason. And uh, one of the guys who leads the Rays in saves is in the game here in the third inning. The other one, Pete Fairbanks, was up in the bullpen. Gives you a little idea as to how important this inning has become for Tampa. J.D. Martinez, the batter, he singled in the second. There have been plenty of head to heads here. In 12 previous at bats, Martinez has three hits, all of them singles. Well, it's not an elimination game, but it sure gets the feel that Kevin Cash is pitching or trying to pitch this game like an elimination game. And certainly you can understand this inning could have been and still can be a huge inning for the Red Sox. Oh, and two, the count to Martinez. Boston opens the inning with four straight singles off of two different pitchers. They chase Drew Rasmussen. Martinez has long been a terror with runners in scoring position, and this year, no exception. He's been crushing breaking balls off of right handed pitchers this year. Stays with the firm stuff and strikes him out. Does Andrew Kittredge a big punch out? Two runs in the inning for Boston, however, as the Red Sox have earned their first lead of the afternoon. So the fourth, three to two, Boston. Welcome back to the Good Sam ALDS telecast on MLB Network presented by Geico with John Smoltz and Ken Rosenthal, Matt Vasquez, and a 3 to 2 Red Sox lead as we go to the top half of inning number four. Nate Evaldi, Randy Arozarena, and Kevin Kiermeyer. G Man Choi, Randy Arozarena, and Kevin Kiermeyer against Nate Evaldi. Odd pregnant pause to start the inning. And here we go. Oh, that's up. What was this about John. Well he just looked up and he hadn't finished his uh, kind of routine at the plate and just stepped out they didn't have to give it to him. No that's an awfully late time there. It's a ball and a strike to Choi. And Nate Evaldi sat around for uh, about 23 minutes. While that last half inning took place, he goes back to work with seven strikeouts already today in just three innings. In front of Choi, a ball and two strikes. Oh, Ooh, what a take. That was a perfect pitch. And it was so good that I don't think Choi had any choice but to get lucky and see if it was called a ball. Two two pitches bounced out to first. There he goes. Better toss this <laughs> <laughs> There's the momentum going towards the pitcher. <laughs> He's tipping his cap. Look at him work in the room. Oh. <laughs> How great is that? that Playoff is. game. He's having the time of his life. He's like, I'm coming towards you this time. And there you go. And <laughs> here it is. <laughs> Look, Gibsonian fist pump there. One gone here for Rivaldi. And now it's Randy Arozarena, one of the strikeout victims earlier. You know the Red Sox and who knows how the series is going to go but the series is going kind of the way their season has gone and really talks a lot about how Alex and his leadership speaks to this team never putting their head down. They lost the first three games of the season to the Orioles and it was already stories being written about what last year was and what this year is not going to be then they had a huge lead. And then blew the lead and had to fight like mad to get into the playoff at the end. And he just said his team never 
changed throughout any of that and that says a lot about what Alex is able to do. Well they were among the many teams this year to have to deal with COVID outbreaks through the course of the 162 game regular season and it happened to hit the Red Sox and some of their star players. But Rosarena strikes out again. Ken Rosenthal can you add on that. Well Matt if you remember their season appeared on the verge of coming apart. They placed 13 players on the COVID-19 injured list between August 27th and September 12th right in the thick of the pennant race. And the low moment came actually at Tropicana Field that was on August 31st. That's when they had to pull Bogarts off the field in the bottom of the second because he had tested positive. And you could see the team immediately kind of wilt. Next inning they allowed six runs the worst inning they played all year. The first pitch swing from Kevin Kiermeyer and a very quick one two three four. Kenny we can finish that thought as we continue. Quickest inning of the game so far on either side of the scorecard it stays at three to two Red Sox lead. Williams Bourbon will give one million dollars to one lucky fan enter the triple play sweepstakes at Evan Williams dugout .com for a chance to win big. Oh it's inside. Hunter Renfro Kevin Ploiecki and Christian Arroyo against Andrew Kittridge who continues in relief. He was able to get the final out in the bottom of the third stranding runners in scoring position when he struck out J.D. Martinez. And it's a ball and two strikes to the former Ray Hunter Renfro. Check the count one and one one and one. Andrew Kittrich has such a distinctive style. He stands with his back exposed to the hitter. Almost appears to lean back oh. until the very moment he lets the ball go. Uh, he's everything he throws moves, and he certainly has tremendous movement on his fastball and the breaking ball and secondary stuff. Miss bats. Dealing with a Boston lineup that has been loud. Stackcast powered by Google Cloud. Most folks play Hunter Renfro to pull. Broken bat flare that's going to drop in, and it's another leadoff hitter that reaches base. All four of them so far today. Yeah, pretty amazing when you think about the stakes of a playoff game. And that's a pretty good recipe if you're going to score some runs is get that leadoff hitter on and that bat went down a hero. Well Kittredge will try to deliver a ground ball here he's got a, a good ground ball rate almost 55 percent well above league average and here's Kevin Ploiecki who grounded into the inning ending double play back in the second. There's another bouncer. Loud to Franco. And another twin killing off the bat of Kevin Ploiecki. They're two gone. Coming up later on, don't miss a winner go home ALDS game three on FS1. Down two games to none. Pressure on the Southsiders is Anderson Abreu in the White Sox. Look to hold the line against Altuve Alvarez in the Astros. Do or die tonight, 8 Eastern, 7 Central over on FS1. This is when they say Taylor made, that's Taylor made. Yeah. Wonder where that came from. I was going to ask you that because it's also a golf. Time. Oh, it's golf, yeah, but that I don't think it has anything to do with, with golf. Room service. Custom made, I mean, right there for the picking. Yeah, we used to have uh, make sure a couple of our guys were never in room 643 because they hit in 643s <laughs> all the time, or vice versa, 463. We had to keep them out of the room. Ridiculous. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard some ridiculous superstitions by you over the years. That might be uh, that might be the topper. You're like, 
traveling sector please don't put so and so in room six four three please we've seen enough of them. You're getting a text from Jeff Blauser. Right <laughs> Rolled back up the middle Franco smothers it gets to his feet throws the first not in time. Almost another terrific play by the rookie shortstop. This is another selfish reason why you know. I'd like to see the shift go away because of players like him that can field so many different places right. He's taking care of that whole area and he almost makes to you call a great play had he picked that ball up maybe even sooner that would have been the difference but. Man. Covers some ground. Once again. That gives Schwarber a chance to bat with the man on as he did back in the third when he kept the line moving he hit the second of four straight singles that opened the inning. Ball a tip. Among players that were traded at the deadline Kyle Schwarber's OPS after the trade was the best in baseball. He was really good with the Nationals to start the year and has made a huge impact on the Red Sox. And a lot of people thought Rizzo was the can't miss choice. If you're going to improve an upgraded first base, everybody thought Rizzo would be the guy. What with his background here in Boston and all. Heim Bloom and the Red Sox went out and found Kyle Schwarber. He paid immediate dividends not only with his own performance but on the impact he'd had on Bobby Dahlbeck. Hurt. Quite a one two punch quite a platoon combination at first base for Boston a position that was thought to be a weakness early in the year caught the outside corner when he was trying to go to the inside corner see if he throws a slider sliders that kryptonite pitch right now for Schwarber. Of all the ones that he sees, this one's he swings and misses a lot on. Time out! Schwarber wanted time. A long hold there by Kittridge. Yeah, getting a little deeper into that first base position, Schwarber and Dahlbeck combined to put up really good numbers this year. And a lot of it based on Dahlbeck's improvements after Schwarber was acquired. Still the ball on two strikes. out in short right in the repositioned infield alignment against a notorious ground ball pull hitter. Kevin Cash very aware of the fact that Schwarber has been a problem today. A homer a single he scored two runs. And he's a strikeout victim in his third at bat of the afternoon. A scoreless fourth posted by Andrew Kittridge on to inning number five in a still one run game. Geico Ween switched to Geico for more ways to save. Native Aldi back to work to the top of the fifth inning we go Mike Zanino Joey Wendell and Brandon Lau and one of the big differences in this game in the whole series if you want to go back to the Tampa games one and two is Boston's ability to get the leadoff hitter aboard and the Tampa Bay Rays relative inability to do that. They are 0 for 4 trying to place their leadoff hitter on base today. Oh, it's upside. Boston's put their leadoff hitter aboard in all four innings today. And in fact, for the Red Sox, their leadoff hitter has reached in 12 of their last 22 opportunities. Well, 
what you're seeing out of Nathan Avaldi is nothing new, but what is new is his ability to mix and match his secondary stuff. He didn't have a few years ago. He didn't have the split finger. He's improved the backspin on his breaking ball and gets downhill with the fastball. He was given up an alarming high average on his fastball prior to the last injury and getting underneath the baseball, but now he goes. If you can imagine, you get a chance to see where his mark when he lands, he's throwing the baseball pretty, pretty close to the hitter, and it's exploding out of his hand. Turned into another long plate appearance here for Mike Zanino, who, in his first at bat, had his longest plate appearance of the year. He extracted 11 pitches out of Vivaldi before finally striking out. There's the landing spot, and that's getting downhill. A big, tall guy using all his force. That's why he's throwing 98, 99 miles an hour. Zanino sends a drive out to left, carries for Verdugo. Well, when you talk about all the strikeouts, it's come via the splitter a lot, and that pitch is dropping out of the zone. You see the first three right there, splitters. There's a slider and get a fastball above the zone. You just can't eliminate any pitches when a man is throwing strikes and utilizing his secondary stuff and getting you in a bind because you can't come off his fastball. That's why he has this many strikeouts. And really, the Rays are got to figure out a way to make him throw as many pitches in the next two innings yeah. as possible. Yeah. Here's a number nine hitter, Joey Wendell. Well, back oh. to the splitter for Rivaldi. He's already thrown more splits. Today than he did in the entire start against the Yankees in the wild card game. He threw eight splitters against New York. He's thrown it 16 times so far today. It's garnered 12 oh. swings and nine whips. And if those numbers stay like that, it, it's going to be one of the highest whiff percentage games against anybody's split finger fastball all year. And that just tells you that the hitters can't pick up. It coming out of his hand and the depth of it's great. Wow, he gets a call on a backdoor breaking ball there. Ball and two strikes to count to Joey Wendell. Yeah, you get a call like this now, Wendell's in a bind. I mean, not because he's gotten two strikes on him, he's in a bind because now the plate just got four inches, two inches on either side bigger in his mind because what he thought was a ball was called a strike. A little hesitation there. Going back to some of his Dice K. Louis Tion stuff that he showed us during the wild card game and has done during the year. He'll drop down at a different angle. He'll quick pitch. Watch the hesitation move. I'll show it to you again. He's working quickly here on a two and two count down to Joey Wendell. Wendell serves that into the opposite field. It gets past Verdugo. Wendell on his way to second. And that snaps a stretch of seven in a row retired by Nate Evaldi. That's pretty good hitting by Wendell. He had uh, he had himself put in the box there after that curveball that was called a strike. Well he got another curveball and stayed on it. And that one just spun there didn't take the turn. And he much like most left handers. And if they go the other way, a la Wade Boggs, that wall is close. It's unbelievable how close it is. You can't imagine it, and I don't know if TV can do it any justice until you either A, take BP, B, shag out there. And there's a lot of responsibilities that the center fielder and the left fielder, shortstop, third baseman have to have when it comes to that wall and the bounces it takes off of it. It's not your normal duties like shortstops would never have to run out to left field in any other ballpark they do here because they got to help out the left fielder same thing with the center fielder. Well you can tell Verdugo is trying to get there aggressively and, and hold Wendell to a single and that's when the ball squirted past him. Oh and two to count to Brandon Lau. Struck out in the first and reached on the error to Schwarber in the third. 
You wouldn't know it by the way this game has started, but Lau has really liked his experiences hitting at Fenway Park. He's been great here for his career. Great job there. That was a spiked, I think, split that ate up. Lewecki able to just keep that in front of him. He has worked really well with Nate Evaldi. He's turned into a personal catcher, and we asked Alex Cora about that before the game today. And he said, Yeah, I actually don't mind if you say that's the case, because that's kind of what it is. They're good together. And that's his guy back there. So it's a ball and two strikes to Brandon Lau, who is a 444 career hitter at Fenway Park. And among players with at least 50 at bats here, that is the highest average ever. That was a good take. He had thrown that where he wanted to, and Lau had been swinging at that pitch. I still think he can throw him another one, but there's your point there at Fenway Park. Switch hitter next, and then the left handed power threat of Austin Meadows, and that's why you see lefty Josh Taylor up in the Boston bullpen, as dominant as of all he's been. Lau sends that to center field, right in the tracks of Kike Hernandez, who makes the catch for out number two. And pitching coach Dave Bush is coming out now. I feel like in this inning, John, there's at least some uh, louder contact by the Rays. Yeah, they worked them over 80 pitches, and that's huge if you're only in the fourth inning as a starting pitcher because that only gives you room for maybe two more innings. And and right now, the way he's throwing and the way the Rays are seeing or not seeing the ball, moral victories are to get him out of the game as soon as possible. And so this meeting is going to be about talking about Franco and. And the attack of how they want to see this young man who's so, so living up to the highest of expectations. I guess when you're number one prospect in baseball, there's not much. I don't know. Can you exceed the ceiling? I mean, uh, it, number one with a bullet with an asterisk. Take a look at where Evaldi is in the game, four and two thirds into it. Wander Franco led the Rays in batting average, contact rate. Had a 43 game on base streak during the season. It put him in the company of a number of Hall of Famers. He has justified that number one prospect status that he wore for two years. Here he is in a big spot, Hurt. takes a strike. Frank Robinson, Mickey Mantle, Arky Von Mellot. And a pretty good list for a guy that's still in the infancy of his major league career. 43 games in which he reached base safely. The longest among players age 20 or younger. Well, his average is uh, about 385 when he's facing pitchers that get over the 80 pitch mark, or whatever that's worth. Saw that number, so I thought I'd throw it out there. Like it. And a ground ball for Schwarber that's going to get Evaldi out of the jam. A runner left stranded in scoring position. Middle of the late afternoon. And the home side still on top by a run. Raise into the bullpen for their third reliever of the afternoon. He is the hard throwing right hander Peter Fairbanks. He'll draw Kike Hernandez, Rafi Devers, and Xander Bogarts. First things first, keep the leadoff hitter off base. And Hernandez staying aggressive falls behind 0 1 on the foul ball. Fairbanks really good during the regular season. 
He was really good in last year's ALCS but stumbled in the World Series against the Dodgers last year. And this early series of moves to the back of the Rays bullpen has been fascinating to watch. Oh. Kenny does this uh, give us any insight on on the way the rest of this day or series might set up. Well Matt it's obvious they're going for it here. But for game four it was always going to be a bullpen game and the two guys they probably will stay away from today would be Colin McHugh and Luis Patino and they can start one of them and use the other in back of that guy in game four. If it's Patino that would be a fourth straight rookie starter. We talked about the relative inexperience of the Rays rotation when we went on the air today. It's been a theme certainly. Drew Rasmussen two plus. Two one to Kike hit a bunch out to left. And that one's gone. Oh man. Kike Hernandez is the hottest hitter on the planet. Sox. Devers trying to make it back to back. Right in the wheelhouse, inner third. That's where his swing plane is at his best. And man, is he at his best right now? I'll tell you what, that swing, I know we've been talking about Devers, but he walked out of the box after that swing, trying to, whatever discomfort in that bottom hand, trying to get it back. Was he? Faces 98, 99 miles an hour. Devers falls behind 0 2. Kike Hernandez has hits in seven straight at bats. I mean, bear in mind he had a record setting Friday, and he's followed it up with a three for three, including a homer here in game three today. It's too bad they don't give out any awards for the first series, which I never understood, by the way. With you, I've never gotten that myself, and that oh, looked like man. a really painful swing by Devers. And there's one gone. I mean, this is just foot down, watch the bat path, just right to the baseball. Let the power of the arm and the ball that came in there fly out. And again, what I thought was going to be so interesting in this series is starting to play out. How are the Rays going to navigate the games that were started by young pitchers against a vaunted really really good offense and right now that offense is flexing its muscles not to mention Matt, you get to see these guys multiple times in a series the Rays that is so yeah. that's why this game is being managed the way it is because Kevin Cash knows a what he's going up against and what he's got left for the next game he's got to keep this one close. Ballman no strikes the count to Xander Bogarts. Second leadoff homer of the game. The Rays still have not retired a leadoff oh, batter up. in an inning today. I, I'm just I'm, I'm speechless at what Kike Hernandez is in the midst of here. In game two just by way of refresher. He tied the major league postseason record. For hits in a game with five. Match the Red Sox record. It also tied a major league postseason record for extra base hits in a game. Four of his five hits were for extra bases, and there was no cooling him off tonight. What Change a of venue, day off, didn't matter. This guy is unstoppable right now. Not to mention what his postseason career average just went up to. I mean, that's that's significant. Two balls and two strikes. That's. Eight hits. I mean, he had, he had, to your point, had success as a Dodger in the postseason. Mm -hmm. 
his career has put him in the postseason virtually every one of his seasons as a big leaguer. I mean, this is his 62nd postseason game. Oh. Full count now, three and two to Xander Bogarts. Well, if there was a division series MVP, Kiki Hernandez is off to a great start toward that. Born in Puerto Rico, originally drafted by the Astros, won a ring last year as a Dodger, and came aboard in Boston on a two year, $14 million deal, the likes of which Alex Cora described as a deal that kind of cemented our team. And there's ball four. Kenny I'm sure there's a, a lot of other clubs out there with remorse over not getting involved in the Kike Hernandez sweepstakes in the uh, in the winter. There is Matt but what's interesting here is that the initial plan with him was to play him at second base. Maybe we want to see what's going on with this meeting first. And I don't know that uh, anybody saw a health concern coming for Pete Fairbanks today. Something to do with the mound and where he landed. Okay. In my opinion. All right. So the original plan with Kike was to play him at second base. That way he'd finally settle in at one position. But for the Red Sox, the greater need developed in center field. He played only five games there in spring training, but he winds up playing the majority of the time in center and is one of the best defensive center fielders in the game. If you go by defensive run saved, that's a cumulative stat. He ranked third in the majors among all center fielders behind only Michael A. Taylor and Harrison Bader and he played far fewer innings than those guys. He told me I never thought the one spot I'd find would be out in center field. He has really solidified the Red Sox with his play in center for sure and that's Alex Cora's words not ours. It's been an unstoppable force at the plate in this series and here's Alex Verdugo now 0 for 2 so far he's got a runner aboard a run in with one away. Go back to the pitch before the mound visit to see if we can identify the concern with Fairbanks. Hey, he turned his landing foot there. Yeah, it was. It, you know, you're dealing with uh, when you come in as a reliever, you're dealing with everybody else's work. Runner goes. Boy, a big jump had Bogarts, and it's a foul ball by Verdugo. And so the landing of of all these a little deeper, and so Fairbanks hits the spot. Different than you would if it was a clean mound and creating your own landing spot. So that's a part of being a reliever and understanding to navigate around the mound that's already been uh, used. And Evaldi's looking like he's done. Yeah, that's a guy in exhale. You're yeah, right. you, you don't hang out like that in a game of this magnitude. Tampa's got JP Fireisen up in the bullpen. The other player, along with Rasmussen, that came from Milwaukee on the Willie Adamas trade back in May. We've showed you Josh Taylor, who's been up for a while, a couple times now with the Red Sox. It appears he's coming into the ballgame next inning. You got a lot, a lot of baseball to play here still today. Fairbanks trying to hold the Red Sox to just the run on the Hernandez homer. One and one to Alex Verdugo. This right here is too big of a swing for a guy who's struggling with something. And again, it's not normal, right, when you take that hand off. The way he's been taking it off on particular swings up. And this one took a lot longer for him to recover after his swing and misses, seeing games one and two swing and misses. Same kind of scenario, but this one took a longer time. I got to give him a lot of credit for whatever he's dealing with and uh, showing up and grinding it out.
Verdugo with a swing and a miss. That one gets away from Zanino. In real time, we weren't sure if that was fouled away or not. It's a strikeout recorded on Verdugo with Bogarts advancing to second. Zanino just boxed it. Yeah, it just backed up and uh, caught the wrong part of the glove, anticipating the turn a little more. Runner in scoring position now for J.D. Martinez, who has singled and struck out. Oh, it's inside. And this is again where I would be a little nervous with the right field being right open, meaning the right side of the infield, nobody there. You see Choi's way off the line to try to protect. But this is the kind of hitter where JD can serve one the other way. He did it twice in Tampa. That's into right field. It's going to carry for a Rosa Reina to retire the side. Nothing further after the homer. However, Kike Hernandez with more damage in the series. 17 total bases in two and a half games. And a now 4 2 Boston lead. Boston goes to the bullpen for the first time as Nate Evaldi is a wrap after five great innings today. The only damage the two run homer by Austin Meadows in the first and it's Josh Taylor here in the sixth. Not a lot of left handed relief options for Alex Cora. Taylor's first offering to Austin Meadows is fouled off into the seats. It's really Taylor and Martin Perez. Who spent most of his time in the rotation as a Red Sox this year. But this is a, a key moment in the game by virtue of the two left handed hitters that are scheduled to come to the plate here. Taylor fastball touches 95 or above and pretty much slider curveball. And we get a chance in this type of game because of the series and where it's at to see about 13 pitchers maybe between two teams. Good, good. What are we at now? Postseason baseball at its finest. Six and counting. Meadows with a bouncing ball for Bogarts on the other side of the second base bag for the first down. Reminder to get your game on at MLBShop.com for authentic on field caps, tees, hoodies, and more. Get all your postseason gear and wear what the champs wear at the official source, MLBShop.com. Well, and you can predict which players will stack the most total bases each day. Get Kike Hernandez, congratulations. Compete to win $20,000 in an MLB base chase presented by Mikabo Ultra at MLB.com slash base chase. See official rules for details. This is one of those games that if you're the Red Sox fan, you're like, you're not happy that you're only up two, right? Feels like you should be up five, six. You're mashing the ball, you're on base all the time. So it's still within striking distance for the Rays, and I think that's why Kevin Cash. Is approaching it from his bullpen standpoint, but now the Red Sox, whose bullpen was hot down the stretch, needs to deliver in the moment from the sixth, seventh with the lead. Nelly Cruz struck out twice against Ivaldi. Oh, too hot. It's a ball and a strike. Well the Boston bullpen was not in great shape at the end of the regular season. Remember Boston had to come from behind on the final Sunday of the regular season to earn a spot in the wild card game. But ever since oh, the postseason started Boston's bullpen has been on lockdown a 2.50 ERA in the playoffs. The home runs been a little problem they've allowed five earned four of them on homers. But Alex got a couple guys that got that guy in particular he got a couple guys hot that he wanted to go to and Brazier Robles maybe overall the numbers didn't look great for a lot of them but they got in a kind of a mode where he could go to three guys that he wanted to 
And that's the dream of every manager to have three hot starters three hot relievers and three hot hitters in your lineup and then you, you, you can navigate a lot with that formula. Tanner Hawk was unbelievable oh. on Friday. Brazier three strikeouts in a perfect inning on Friday and Cruz one hops it past Bogarts on into left. A one out single in the Tampa sixth. And now Kevin Cash is likely to make a move to his bench. He had G Man Choi scheduled. He's got Yandy Diaz available, and Diaz and Choi kind of played a platoon game at first base, and it's going to be Yandy Diaz to bat here. How about <laughs> just to show you the way Rays do things? How about Luplo hits a grand slam and then gets pinch hit yeah. more than I Yeah, that's <laughs> you're right though. That's the Rays. That's the DNA. I mean. And that Dave Bush is going to come out with a little reminder on how to attack Yandy Diaz since he was not in the starting lineup. When it comes to your health, what you do next matters most. Roman, official partner of Major League Baseball. So the Rays go to the bench for a Citrix pinch hitter. And after Diaz, it's the right handed hitting Randy Arozarena. Taylor's got to face at least one more batter. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a bullpen move for that guy. Mm -hmm. One out, one on. And a strike to Gandhi Diaz. Diaz has had some postseason success a couple of years ago, a pair of homers in the AL wildcard game against Sean Manaya. In the air out to shallow right field, Arroyo backing up on it from second for route number two. So a Rosa Reina is scheduled and here comes Alex Cora to make his move for Brazier. I mean we keep saying this but this is setting up the biggest at bat of the night so far. Sure is and they've done a nice job after a Rosa Reina did his thing in game one shut him down. Boston goes to the bullpen. The story of last year's postseason Randy Arozarena has a chance to make his mark on this year's postseason when we come back. I can turn anyone into a beach bomb. I bring families together for a living. I make memories for people I don't know yet. I know this view is too good not to be shared. I am a verbal host. Here's a good Halloween trick. Buy a bunch of Reese's. Uh-huh, there you go. Turn off all the lights in your house. Yeah, yeah. And then you just don't answer the door. I'm sorry, Reese's. Enjoyment isn't part of the process. Don't trust the process. Our house seemed like a dream come true. Great character, great neighborhood. Until Mrs. Cashman started feeding the neighborhood cats. All the cats. We need to move right now. With Rocket Mortgage, we can adjust our home loan options in real time. Customize our monthly payment, down payment, and closing costs. And no cats. It was a catastrophe. Just no. When you need control over your home loan, Rocket can. Rocket. Wendy's new Big Bacon Cheddar is here. Because to make new flavors, you have to go above and beyond. Unlike some places. Wendy's put cheddar on the bun? What do we got? Sesame seeds. Yes. Yeah. Seeds. <laughs> yeah. Try Wendy's new Big Bacon Cheddar today. I wonder how the firm's doing without its fearless leader. Are you sure you want to leave that all behind? Yeah. 
Stay restless with the RX, crafted by Lexus. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. Well, there has been one career meeting between Red Sox right-hander Ryan Brazier and Tampa's Randy Arozarena. It came on Friday when Brazier struck out the side in the bottom of the seventh inning. Arozarena represents the tying run here. Top half of inning number six and a 4-2 Boston lead. Back to Brazier. One pitch does the job tonight. To the bottom of the sixth, still four to two Red Sox. Be network with Hall of Famer John Smoltz and Ken Rosenthal, Matt Vasquez, and a 4 2 Red Sox lead. Go to the bottom half of inning number six, Yandy Diaz, as we guessed, staying in the game at first base for G Man Choi and JP Fireisen takes over on the mound for the Rays. He'll get the bottom third of the Boston order oh, it's and will try to retire a leadoff hitter for the first time tonight. All five have reached base safely for Boston. That includes the two homers. That led off innings by Swarber and Hernandez. Yeah, pretty amazing to be this far into the game and can't have gotten the leadoff hitter out yet. It speaks to the volume of offense that the Red Sox have. One of the lesser velocity guys in the pen, but he can spin it. Sliders and changeups, and only about 93, which doesn't seem right if you're coming out of the race pen with only 93. Boston showing a pinch hitter next. First the 1-1 one, one home. Two balls and a strike to Hunter Renfro. Christian Vasquez will bat next. And he'll stay in the game at catcher. That all made possible with the departure of Nate Evaldi. Kevin Ploiecki caught him as per usual. So both managers really exercising their roster depth in the middle innings here tonight. Two balls and a strike. Another leadoff hitter reaches base. This is unbelievable. And they're all hits, too. We're not talking about leadoff walks. That matches a Red Sox postseason franchise record. That's the best you can do. Six for six. I mean, wow. It's been Renfro twice on singles in the fourth and now here in the sixth inning and another visit from Kyle Snyder. The last time the Red Sox put six leadoff hitters aboard in a game. And it had happened three times before tonight. Was game five of the 2004 ALCS. Alex Cora signaling to the umpiring crew that he's announcing a pinch hitter. As Christian Vasquez goes to get some last minute instruction from Carlos Fables. They're going to put something on here. Well, we know Alex likes to step on the gas pedal. He's got the leadoff hitter aboard. The guy handles the bat pretty good. I mean he had his power stroke working a couple years ago and he's lost that power stroke. Only six homers this year for Christian Vasquez. Oh, it's inside. Ball and no strikes. Bear in mind that the number eight spot in the Red Sox lineup has been responsible for two double plays in this game. Both of those. Off the bat of Kevin Ploiecki. Arroyo next, and then it's the top of the order, and then the trouble comes with Schwarber Hernandez endeavors. There goes the runner, and it's a swing and a foul tip. Yeah, they had something going here.
Was that a swing and miss or a foul ball? Because Renfro still at second base. That was just a swing and miss. Oh, that's yeah. fouled. Yeah. He's coming back. So yeah. it's. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's a ball and a strike. Vasquez better against righties than he is left handed pitchers, and he likes the ball in the middle third, inner part of the plate. They're going to send him again? I don't I don't think back to back but you never know. He stays put. The bunt is up the first base line for Diaz who applies the tag and the sacrifice works. A reminder to follow all the action of the postseason with the MLB app from real time tracking of every pitch to in depth analysis of the games. Download the MLB app today. Make sure this postseason is major. Okay, I had Boston coming in with 10 sacrifices, put them 24th in the league, and Tampa is dead last with six. So you just saw something rare. I mean, postseason, right? You just throw it all out, don't you? Yeah. Especially with Alex Cora. And here's Arroyo now with a chance to play to run a man in scoring position. Part of the Red Sox crazy offensive success Friday night in St. Pete was that they went nine for 18 with runners in scoring position. They're two for six in game three today. Owen won the count to Arroyo, who's got two singles on his line. Chopper to third. Nicely played by Wendell for route number two. Now, what do you do? You don't walk him to get to <laughs> Kike. Are you kidding me? You want to face Babe Ruth? No chance. I mean, I'm right. right? Yeah, okay. no, absolutely. I thought maybe I was missing something no, there. No. I mean, maybe if it was a regular human on deck, you'd consider it because Schwarber is is always a threat. But I mean, Kike Hernandez is unconscious right now. Yeah, you're definitely aware of it when you're on the mound, knowing you go over the scouting reports and nothing's been executed, or you just tip your hat and you say, "Okay, I can't let this guy beat me anymore." First pitch to Schwarber's fouled off. And honestly, not to say anything disrespectful that wouldn't be the guy you're circling in their lineup because their lineup so deep you Understood. might circle other guys and totally. go okay yep you know now you're now that's a it's a sharpie circle now it's a bullseye circle because he has beaten you in the last two games at a rate that just is unfathomable. Oh and one the count to Kyle Schwarber. Bouncing ball into the shift for Lau, and that runner in scoring position is left stranded. A big hold by JP Fire Eisen and the Rays to the seventh. 3:30. It's the White Sox if they can hang on tonight, forcing a game four against the Astros. That'll be followed by at seven o'clock game four of this Rays Red Sox series on FS1, and then at 9:30 back to TBS for game three Giants Dodgers. Terrific action all day tomorrow. Ryan Brazier continues top of the seventh inning. We we'll get Kiermaier, Zanino, and Wendell. And yes, we're in the seventh inning. But this is the time of the night when the Rays feast. Christian Vasquez takes over at catcher, as we guessed. Tampa has a plus 113 run differential from the seventh inning on this year. That was the best in baseball during the regular season. 0 oh, and 2 to Kiermeyer. They have already tonight, however, used 
two of their high leverage relievers. Boston holding a two run lead in the seventh. Two strike count and then the Red Sox modify their infield shift. That's foul. Kiermaier fouls that one off. One of the recon projects in the Tampa bullpen right hander Matt Whistler is up. Rays have that unique showed it before the arm slots so many different arm slots that come out of the bullpen kind of like every angle you want to try to offset the style of hitting that exists today. And Kiermaier strikes out. So Brazier got the Rays or the Red Sox rather out of a tight spot in sixth with one pitch when he got a Rosarena to tap out in front of the plate. He strikes out Kiermaier and now he faces Mike Zanino. If Tampa comes back to win tonight. It would come against the Boston bullpen. And part of that narrative would have to include Zanino's two very long plate appearances against Nate Evaldi, contributing to just a five inning start. The kind of thing that wouldn't really show up in the box score. In back to back postseason games, John, you know this as well as anybody, faces the exact same part of a lineup. Yeah. And that's what Brazier's doing here. He faced Zanino, Kiermeyer, and Rosarena on Friday, and he gets that same group in reverse order tonight. Yeah, it doesn't always work that way, but it's nice if it does, because then you've got some history to go on. These are all the pitches. You see the quick examples of what he faced and how long it took. And then finally, Avaldi strikes him out on a high fastball. It's the other left handed reliever, Austin Davis, up in the bullpen for Boston. Again, you can include Martin Perez in that group, though he pitched primarily as a starter this year. Sanino fouls another one away. <laughs> He's been entertaining tonight, uh, hasn't he? There's a railing there. It's Eduardo Rodriguez. He is technically available today in relief if need be. Short start from Chris Sale on Friday. You throw all those availability equations into a different mix in the postseason for sure. Still 0 2 to Zanino. About 39,000 people thought that was a swing and a miss. <laughs> I know how you feel, sir. I make that mistake all the time. <laughs> Plus fouls off the breaking ball. The next 0 2. On the ground to the left side. Bogarts gathers it in with plenty of time to get him. This crowd fired up, standing up. About it, what? Hour or so ago, they were relieved by their other hometown team when winning on the road on a field goal. That's right. So they're relaxed. They're yeah. ready for a doubleheader. Sweet. Yeah, I mean, it did not start out as a good day for the Pats. It's going to be off for Brazier with Joey Wendell scheduled to hit. The call will go out to Austin Davis. A pitching change for the Sox. We'll be right back. 
It's a nice truck. Yeah, it's a Chevy Silverado. Check out this multi-flex tailgate. Multi-flex, huh? Wow. Come to step. <laughs> Mom, Dad's flexing again. That's not all. You can extend the bed for longer stuff. Is right? he still? He's still flexing. That's right. And it becomes a workspace. You can put your laptop here. I'm sending an imaginary email. Hey, Dad, dinner. Hey, look who stopped by Daddy's office. Wait, you work here? The Chevy Silverado with the available multi-flex tailgate. Find new flexibility, find new roads. Chevrolet. Does your deodorant keep you fresh all day? We put Dove Men deodorant to the test with Nelson, a volunteer that puts care into everything he does. It really protects my skin. It's comfortable and it lasts a long time. Dove Men, 48-hour freshness with triple action moisturizers. I can turn anyone into a beach bomb. I bring families together for a living. I make memories for people I don't know yet. I know this view is too good not to be shared. I am a verbal host. Welcome to Allstate, where we've just lowered our auto rates. And savings like that, follow you everywhere. Now get new lower auto rates with Allstate. Because better protection costs a whole lot less. You're in good hands with Allstate. Click or call for a lower auto rate today. I look fly. Yeah, yeah. I look good. Cool. Look good. Feel good. Play good. Gillette Pro Glide. Five blades and a pivoting flex ball to get virtually every hair on the first stroke. Look good, game good. Gillette. All right, the wheels continue to turn in both dugouts. Changes on both sides, starting with a new pitcher, left hander Austin Davis. Austin Davis, 93 to 94 mile an hour fastball with a slider curveball changeup. He will face a pinch hitter batting for Joey Wendell the right handed hitting Jordan Luplo. And if you saw the grand slam he hit against Chris Sale on Friday you know all about what he can do against left handed pitching. He has been used in this capacity throughout his career in Cleveland in Tampa. Base is empty with two gone and it. it Find ways to find guys to do their thing, right? We but they put guys in positions to uh, have success. And now Davis has fallen behind three balls and no strikes. Brandon Lau waits on deck. To find a way to get Franco a chance this inning. Switch hitter who could bat right handed against Davis. Ball four. And it's a four pitch walk to the pinch hitter. Now I got some thunder coming to the plate, tying run coming to the plate. That's really all you want from this point on. You got to get the tying run to the plate every chance you can if you're the race with very little time left. Lau's overall numbers on the screen against lefties, however, they are significantly lower. Hurt. And there's Davis's first strike. The 662 OPS against left-handed pitching for Brandon Lau, and a batting average under 200. He is just trying to figure out a way to keep the line moving and give Wander Franco a chance next. Oh, Ball and a strike. At this point, you're in the dugout, the Rays. You're like outfield grass. And the reason you say outfield grass, you want that ball to touch outfield grass. Two and one. 
seven pitches only one strike issued by Davis since entering the game. How disciplined can Lau be to avoid any kind of spin right here look for one pitch. And avoid anything that breaks. Yeah, that was close. Luplo looked like he might have been leaning. Can't imagine him going anywhere here. Some of those splits that we talked about a moment ago with Lau, much more damage against right-handers. That's well hit into center field, but playable for Kike Hernandez to retire the side. Kike leads things off in the bottom of the inning, trying to further a franchise record. G.K. Hernandez right in the middle of another Boston lead 4 2 Red Sox some changes for the Rays Jordan Luplo after pinch hitting takes over at first that moves Yandy Diaz across the diamond to third and a new pitcher for Tampa as well. Their sixth of the game is the veteran right hander Matt Whistler had to get that slider to be a little more effective than it was last game. Hey they got him out. The first time a Red Sox leadoff hitter has been retired tonight. And the first time Hernandez has hit into an out tonight. Might have to bench him next game, I think. <laughs> uh, some info on Matt Whistler, uh, as John alluded to. He gave up the go ahead three run homer to J.D. Martinez in game two on Friday night. He was acquired from the Giants in June. 29 year old veteran right hander who has spent time in a number of different uniforms. And he just did something that's proven very difficult. Had an index finger or finger issue with that. An injury that was affecting his slider. They continue to pound Devers with high fastballs. How about two pitches and two outs for Matt Whistler? Let's go down to Ken Rosenthal with a little bit more on the Rays right hander. Well, Matt, after the last game, there was some question whether the Rays would stay with Whistler or whether they put him on the injured list for this series. Obviously, the next one if they go that far. That right middle finger problem sidelined him twice once in August through early September and then again from September 10th to 30th. But asking Kevin Cash about this today he said he is too valuable for us to run from. He's OK. He's looking for the race first one two three inning Hurt. since the fourth inning on Friday night. Xander Bogart's hitless 0 for 2 with a walk today. And again when it comes to offensive production you would think this series is not a fair fight the way that Boston has been able to just another 11 hits today 20 last game yet they're only up two. I mean that's the Rays kind of find a way to hang in there and they got two innings to do something about that. Bogarts lines it to left. Oh man Meadows just stabbed it out of midair. That one had some hair on it. Yeah, it's like running down a speeding bullet. A five pitch inning with a little help. And a still two run game in Boston. It's a compliment as much as it is an indictment. <laughs> I say that with nothing but love. MLB tonight Greg Harold and Hunter breaking everything down right after the game tonight. 
another pitching change as Hansel Robles takes over to work the top of the eighth uh, and they're taking to calling him uh, high leverage Hansel because he has established a role in Boston's bullpen down the stretch where he has really excelled in spots like this one facing the toughest part of the Tampa lineup. Now the only thing about and he's been hot he's one of those hot guys that you, that Alex has gone to is it only takes one guy to be off his mechanics and not throw strikes to change the way the game's going with this many pitchers in the game you're asking everybody to come in and be on their game so far most of them have and for the Red Sox they're hoping the last two or three that come in will do the same thing. Robles has fallen behind Wander Franco oh. now three balls and no strikes. Meadows next and then Nelson Cruz. And that's the only downside of not having your hot hand stay in the game as long as possible because now you bring in the chance of somebody not having a hot hand at a crucial time. I'm reminded of this having just watched uh, Hunter Pence. The only team to win more games this year than the Rays entering the eighth was Hunter's old uniform of the Giants. Hunt. And it's three and one now. Robles has been great in the playoffs. Predates this year. He's retired 15 of 16 he has faced in the postseason. Franco sends a ball toward the monster. Verdugo looks up and it's gone. Strong human. Young guy. Well, if he wants the baseball, somebody just threw it back. <laughs> Red Sox fan up on the monster seats. And that's the beauty of this ballpark, right? Fastball away. I said you want to get the left handers to pull the ball and the right handers to hit the other way because of that wall. And those that can use that wall and go the other way, wow, do their numbers go up. First career postseason oh, homer for Wander Franco. I mean, you could say he's going to be a star, but he's already a star. Yeah, other than the first two weeks, he really looked a little overmatched. He made the necessary adjustments and then went on that long on base streak that you talked about. 1 0 pitch to Austin Meadows is hit well out to center field, and that's off the monster. Meadows smelled double out of the box, and he's the tying run in scoring position with nobody out. Here come the Rays. Again, this game has had a feel like Boston has completely been so close to breaking this thing open, hitting the ball all over the ballpark, and now we're one swing away in this ballpark of fans thinking, how can this be? The Rays have a chance to tie or take the lead. Another center cut fastball, thinking the other way. If you think about pulling this ball, maybe it doesn't have the results he just had right there. Pitcher number eight or nine? What do we got? Uh, let's see. Hansel is the fifth for Boston, and we've seen six. So we got two more to get to 13. And then there's the number you've seen right there. That the only thing they think about right now is changing that to 13. Wins when trailing the entering the eighth inning. And the Red Sox second few second most games lost after leading going into the eighth inning. Nelson Cruz now. He has singled and struck out twice and right. takes a strike. Boston bullpen is getting hot in a hurry with Garrett Whitlock and Adam Adovino. Little topper. 
It's going to advance the tying run to third. Well, not what you wanted your slugger to do, but in a weird way, at least he got the tying run at third with less than two outs. Puts pressure on Boston to bring the infield in. You have Diaz, who's a pretty good contact guy. Doesn't swing wild out of the zone. Doesn't chase much. Yandy Diaz has been really good this year at scoring the run from third with less than two out 35 opportunities and he's plated that run on 21 of those occasions terrific success as you see the pinch runner Emmanuel Margot pinch running at third for Meadows now you look for sliders in the dirt obviously that's not what Diaz is going to want to swing at he's looking for a fastball up or anything up he can lift. Margot is going to try to read the ball off the ground. I highly doubt they have the contact play on, meaning as soon as he hits it, you go to home here in the eighth. You got a Rosarena waiting on deck. And the first pitch to Diaz misses low. Outfield's playing way too deep, so obviously anything in the air, with the exception of Renfro. Who's got a cannon? You see the green line, the sack fly line, and where the arm strength and the distance. 94 is pretty, pretty solid and right. One 0 pitch. What's the first thing you think of when you see Manuel Margo at third in the postseason? Well, trying to steal home against yeah. Kershaw yeah. right in the World Series last year. And he came so close. Take a look at that outfield alignment for Dugo, exceptionally deep in left. Renfro shallow in right. One one to Diaz foul back challenged him with a ninety eight mile an hour heater That was a great pitch because he threw it in and he he buried it in great pitch not much you can do with that to your point earlier Diaz is awfully tough to strike out. Strikeout rate of less than 16% of his plate appearances. Margo, the tying run at third with only one away. The 1 2. Let's take you back to last year's Fall Classic, Game 5. See, I, th I think it. I looked at that a bunch of time. That sure looked like it could have been called a balk, but he stepped back and he tried his best swim move. And we've said this many times. If it's a full ballpark, maybe Kershaw doesn't hear the yeah. help that he got from the Dodger dugout. Maybe the whole thing goes down differently. Still one and two to Yandy Diaz. Two balls and two strikes. He tried to throw that one a hundred. Biggest lead of the night from either side has been two runs. Tampa had a two run lead early after the Meadows homer in the top of the first. The Red Sox two run lead late has been cut into by the Franco homer. Two two and Yandy a little early hit that a bunch.
Two homers on each side of the scorecard tonight. So far early in this 2021 postseason, the team that out homers the other is undefeated. 8 0. Two. All right, that was the pitcher's pitch, and that's the one that talks about his discipline and his ability to put the ball in play, not just a wild swinger. That's off the plate for a ball, and that's where you want to throw your slider. Tremendous job there by Yandi. He has alternated between fastball and secondary, as you can see here, throughout the plate appearance. Just guard against trying to throw a better slider and bouncing it. Here's the next 2 2. Oh, got him! What a huge pitch. Above the zone, foul tip, 98. And now the Red Sox have done a great job against a Rosarena by at least making him aware of the fastball in. And when he's aware of the fastball in, he gives up on the sliders away, and it gives kind of a feeble effort. First pitch, key, an aggressive hitter who wants to make something happen. Ryan Brazier got him on a first pitch in the sixth to strand a base runner. Tying run 90 feet away with two gone. Offers it the first pitch again. This is the first career meeting between Robles and Rosarena. What a bounce back so far for Robles. Came in, walked the first hitter. Or got wild. I'm sorry, didn't walk first hitter. Gave up the home run after it was three and zero, oh, and he's found his release point. Then the big double to Meadows. A Rosarena sends that into left center field. That's gonna drop and roll all the way to the wall. The Rays have tied it. A Rosarena stumbled on his way to second, but still gets in safely with a double. And Rosarena is calling for some attention at second base. I'm not sure whether he's hurt or if he just wanted to talk to his first base coach, Ozzy Timmons. It looks like he's okay. Well, and, and Kevin Cash is just going to try to get the umpires to agree with him and tell him that he thinks he could have got to third base. But he reaches out and hits the gap. An unbelievable effort. In center field, but watch where uh, Schwarber just trips oh, yeah. him up. Yeah. And trips him up in a place where Schwarber didn't think he would take that wide of a turn. And then the discussion here is going to be about whether or not they think he could have got to third base and he'd be entitled to because of interference. And now Rosarena has come off the field. He's done. <laughs> I think he's just getting a drink of water. <laughs> he was high fiving like he was going right up into the trainer's table. He's all right. Wow, what the gate, an inning. The, the gate's a little gimpy, but he's going to continue. And now Alex Cora is going to come out and make a pitching change. There's the contact. As he kind of tangled feet with Schwarber, who was watching the play unfold. Kike sold out. And tried to save the inning. And the Rays, who've done this all year, have roared right back to tie the game.
Robles is being escorted off the field by the training staff. And Boston's going to the Randy Arroz Arena right in the middle of the comeback. Two runs by the Rays has tied the score. And it has prompted a move to Garrett Whitlock, whose last appearance came on Tuesday in the wild card game. He finished out the game. A terrific body of work in his rookie season with Boston. They have chosen to officially walk Kevin Kiermeyer. And Whitlock will go to work on Mike Zanino with runners at first and second and two away. Three pitch pitcher. He's been one of the other hot guys again for Alex. I hate to sound like a broken record, but again, the more people you bring in, the more opportunities for things like this to happen. This is classic Rays style fight, scratch, crawl. Here's Mike Zanino 0 for 3. The inning started out with the Wander Franco homer. Meadows doubled. With two away, a Rosa Reina doubled in the pinch runner, Manuel Margo, with the tying run. And Kenny, it, it strikes us all that these two Rays rookies right in the middle of their success during the regular season and again tonight. I know Rosarena was the MVP of the ALCS last year, but yes, he is still a rookie. And Franco has so little professional experience still. Before he made his debut with the Rays on June 22nd, all he had done was one short season of rookie ball, one full year of Class A, time at the alternate site last year, and 180 plate appearances at AAA. That was it. All it felt. Two balls and a strike. But we're seeing it play out before our very eyes tonight why those two players are considered the favorites for American League Rookie of the Year. All due respect to Bobby Dahlbeck. Ryan Mountcastle. Adolis Garcia. Two and two. Hey, 98. Go ahead, run in scoring position. And a cold strike three. A new narrative as we head to the bottom half of inning number eight. Two to tie it for Tampa. That's where it stays, thanks to Garrett Whitlock, to the bottom of the inning in a 4 4 ball game. Preventing number eight, Alex Verdugo leads things off against Matt Whistler. Into center field, coming on hard is Kiermeyer to prevent another leadoff knock. The three-time Gold Glover. What a great play! They got to play so deep in center field because of the space they have to cover. So he's playing real deep, and this is a soft liner coming down. So his ability to get there and dive precision and he has made two great catches already in this series one in their home ballpark and that one could have been easily gets by him and the game changer longest tenured member of the Rays such an important part of their success over the years and we're going to have a pitching change now set the realigned outfield defense and yeah, tell you about the new pitcher when we come back. Oh, you're doing it wrong, man. What's wrong with action figures? Nothing, except buying them without Capital One shopping. What's that, Samuel, Mr. L. Jackson? Capital One shopping instantly searches for available coupon codes and automatically applies them. 
Just download it to your computer. Whoa, you're my hero. Yeah, I can tell. You like it? I look good in miniature. Capital One Shopping is kind of genius. What's in your wallet? I don't say it like that, Devin. Incomparable design makes it beautiful. State-of-the-art technology makes it brilliant. The Lexus NX. Experience the crossover in its most visionary form. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. I look fly. Yeah, yeah. I look good. Look good. I look good. Feel good. Cool. Play good. Gillette Pro Glide. Five blades and a pivoting flex ball to get virtually every hair on the first stroke. Look good. Game good. Gillette. I know the best coffee spot in town. I can make a rustic cabin feel modern. I am a guidebook for guests. I can make an indoorsy person outdoorsy. I give families a home, not just a place to stay. I am a Verbo host. Welcome to Allstate where we have all new lower auto rates. And savings like that will make everyone feel like an MVP. Now get new lower auto rates with Allstate. Because better protection costs a whole lot less. You're in good hands with Allstate. Click or call for a lower auto rate today. All right, some changes defensively prior to the start of the inning that we can post for you. Verdugo was retired on the first pitch. Uh, the changes are in the outfield corners where Rosarena goes to left, and Manuel Margo stayed in the game after pinch running, and he takes over in right. JT Shagwa is the new pitcher. Guy who throws his slider an awful lot, and a guy who has faced JD Martinez an awful lot. Yeah, he saw 98. Occasional change ups as well. There's the numbers on the year. Hurt. One and one. Martinez is singled in three tries today. JD Martinez has faced JT Shagwa more than any other hitter in the game. And started out 0 for 9 against him before doubling in September. That spells the 1 for 10, a topper for Zanino, who gets there with plenty of time knowing that Martinez is not at full strength as a runner. Two away, quick reminder you can bet live on the game now when you download the DraftKings Sportsbook app, an official betting partner of Major League Baseball. Scan the QR code now. I mean we, we didn't expect anything less than a late tie tonight because you got two teams that are so evenly matched that are so familiar with one another they split the first two games of the series tied late tonight. I mean I don't play chess but there's been a lot of chess match moves sure right there's yeah. been a lot of mix and match and try to get the bullpen the way you want it and just even the way this game was going I can't help but think that there were a couple times that knockout punch was about to be had by the Red Sox and somehow the Rays found a way to keep it close they tied the game and now we may see 16 pitchers who knows but right now each team knows the importance of this game because of what they have or don't have in game four regarding a starting pitcher. Oh. Ball and a strike to count to Hunter Renfro and to your point there was a stretch in this game John between the second and the seventh innings a long stretch of this game where it just felt like the Rays lineup was flat. But again to your point they trailed by no more than two runs tonight despite those tough middle innings. And they found a way to come back and tie it late. Oh it's upside. So I believe the. Third inning. Four consecutive hits. That's the inning. To start the inning. To four, start the four inning. straight singles for the Red Sox, and they had had to settle with just two runs. Yeah, I agree. Lively fastball at 99 miles an hour by Shagwa. Just 
had to check my sheet that normally is I'm, I'm normally staring at yours but I've, I've been locked in in this playoff game and at least keeping score. Because I normally give don't, up. Don't look at my sheet. <laughs> it's just messy. Full count now. Christian Vasquez on deck next hoping for a chance with two out in the inning if Renfro can keep the inning alive. Three two pitch. Oh, no. Did he check it the appeal he did check his swing and it's ball four. He did. Well, I don't hear you say that often. Kyle Snyder making another visit now. I mean I would think one of this is about look. If he's going to get a hit meaning Vasquez the ball's got to be away. Don't give in to the inner part because that's his stroke for power is the inner third of the strike zone. You just don't want to make a mistake there. You don't say it like that. You give a positive command by saying attack him away with sliders and fastballs away and that's how you kind of fill in the scouting report without setting a negative in somebody's mind. Vasquez laid down the perfect sack bunt back in the sixth inning that advanced a base runner with less than two out but the Red Sox failed to score. The base on balls that Renfro drew with two away ended a stretch of eight straight batters retired by the Tampa bullpen. And they got into it early today when Rasmussen was removed in the third. 1 1. It's been how the Rays have gone about it all year. So much confidence in their bullpen group that it doesn't matter if they're just deploying one or two of them late in the game or if they have to chew up bulk innings as they have tonight. Broken bat pop to retire the side. We're headed to the ninth inning in game three. The Rays and Red Sox still tied at four. Good Sam ALDS telecast on MLB Network presented by Geico written consent. A couple of our colleagues among the all time franchise greats here at MLB Hi. Network Carlos Pena Hall of Famer Pedro Martinez with Hall of Famer John Smoltz and Ken Rosenthal Matt Vaskersian back in a 4 4 game top of the ninth inning. Garrett Whitlock continues. He's got a nothing in one count on Jordan Luplo who drew a a pinch hit base on balls in the seventh. I mean, this guy's been nasty to just think about being a rookie, right? In this spot. Throwing cheese. Well, and a rookie who was hurt down the stretch, there was some concern about his availability as he was on the IL at the end of the season with a right pectoral strain. They activated him for the regular season finale at that game on Sunday the third where Boston had to come back and win on the road in D.C. As we mentioned Whitlock finished out the wild card game Tuesday night. He is painting on the outside corner. He did give up a home run on Tuesday. Again, it was not a high leverage situation. It was a comfortable lead that he inherited that night against the Yankees. A ball and two strikes. Lau and Franco to follow. Oh. Two and two. It's 
So much different this year of course. For the Rays and those who have. Uh, been able to get back to the playoffs last year of course the fans not being in most of the playoffs creates a different environment than this year. And you start feeding off that adrenaline good and bad you want to be in the adrenaline at home but you have to know how to handle the adrenaline at home because it's ramped up as opposed to if you're on the road and pitching in the ninth of course let's say the game stays tied these these this crowd will let you know where you're at. And whether you've made a good pitch or not. That was a good one. Elevated 97 mile an hour fastball to strike out Jordan Luplo. Now it's Brandon Lau. Brandon Lau, good fastball hitter. And he sees a changeup. What a good pitch. In Rays franchise history, there have been two go ahead hits in a postseason game in the ninth inning or later. We certainly remember the most recent Brett Phillips memorable walk off in game four of last year's World Series against the Dodgers. The first came against the Red Sox in the 2013 Division Series. Jose Lobaton had a walk off homer in game three. Pivotal game three tonight in a 4 4 tie to ball and two strikes on Lau. There's Brett. There is just nothing you can do with those two pitches. He dotted each corner, and now he can drop this change up and make it end up in the dirt and, and could possibly get Lau to swing at it because he's he's already set his eyes down low looking at that pitch. Oof, yeah, it was. What a great job there. That is his classic. You set the eyes hitters, the hitters of the eyes down to that spot. He puts a lot of pressure on that 98 mile an hour fastball and throws a great changeup. That was that. That's one you just you put in the hopper and you keep watching if you're Whitlock. And he threw it in the dirt. There's Wander Franco, whose homer started the two run rally in the eighth, brought the Rays to within a run. They would tie it on the Arosa Reina RBI double. That home run makes him the youngest Tampa Bay Ray in franchise history to hit a postseason home run. 20 years, 223 days old. Evan Longoria held the previous record. He homered in a postseason game at the age of 22. He's been pretty good at not swinging and missing at changeups off righties. Bounced up the line for Schwarber, who feeds to Whitlock, and the Red Sox have a chance to walk it off at home tonight. We're going to the bottom of the ninth inning. Game three tied at four. Arroyo then the on FS1. And on a first pitch to Christian Arroyo, a bouncing ball. And one gone for JT Shagwa. Hey, the last time the Boston Red Sox walked off a postseason win, it was game two of the 2013 ALCS. Jared Salta Lamachia did it against Rick Porcello. Doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Eight years ago. Twelve postseason walk-off winners, second only to the Yankees in Major League history. Kyle Schwarber has delivered again tonight. A homer and a single. Make it a homer and two singles as he's aboard as the winning run. Well two pitches two action balls uh, ground ball and now a base hit so they're coming up here ready to swing and nobody's been ready to swing more than Kike. Going to have a pinch runner as Bobby Dahlbeck will run and if a tenth inning is needed he'll stay in the game to play first base. It's amazing how the game always finds a guy who's been in the limelight the entire night and it's Kike Hernandez. 
17 total bases not just in the series John remember he was hitless in game one 17 total bases in two games. That's insane. The major league record for total bases in the first three games of a postseason series Pittsburgh's Bob Robertson with the 1971 Pittsburgh Pirates and that was 20. Strike one from Shagwa former Dodger teammates with the game on the line here in Boston tonight. Well the one thing the Rays are trying to do is see if they can get PK to go the other way Boy, he loves center to left center to pull he wants to pull the baseball. And he's been getting his pitches and doing what he's want what he wants in this series. Falls behind 0 and 2. You saw Nick Pavetta up a moment ago in the Boston bullpen. That's how important this one is for the Red Sox. Pavetta is the scheduled starter tomorrow. But Alex Cora is certainly worried about the present more than the future. I should also remind you that if this game goes into extra innings, the regular season rule starting a runner at second base does not apply. Oh. One and two. Two balls and two strikes. The previous Red Sox record for total bases in the first three games of a postseason series was held by Nomar Garcia Parra, and it was 14. Kike Hernandez has shattered that with 17 total bases so far in this series. A strikeout victim here in the ninth. Wow, what a pitch. Fastball tailing in, ties up. Kike and in the area that he normally Loves to hit the ball. That late movement right there just couldn't get the barrel in his hands to the ball. And now the guy that's probably playing through the most discomfort has a chance to be the hero. Rafi Devers singled in a run in the third. It was the fourth of the four straight hits that led off the inning. That's into the shift for Lau, and we're going to the 10th inning tonight. Extra innings in game three, a 4 4 tie. Boy, have we. <laughs> Bobby Dahlbeck takes over at first base. Uh, you and I had the pleasure of uh, an 18 inning division series game a few years ago between the Giants and the Nationals. And we were both on the call for different organizations. For the longest postseason game in history, game three of the 2018 World Series between the Red Sox and the Dodgers. Nick Pavetta takes over on the mound. He was to be tomorrow's starting pitcher for Boston. And a funny thing happened on the way to game four. An extra innings tie in game three. Yeah, well, fastball straight over the top, and he's got a lot of curve balls that he'll throw from the top of the zone to the bottom. And did a nice job just kind of filling the gap. And now he's asked to do an incredible job here in a tie game. And Manuel Margo has led off with a base hit. That's that curveball. It rolled a little more right to left than north to south. And when it goes north to south, that's when it has better bite and better depth. And that one just allowed Margo to keep his hands back. And be able to serve it out there for a hit. Got to bring up Nelson Cruz with the runner on. One of the Rays' leading home run threats has been limited to a single in four turns at the plate. Well, the Rays' fortunes have changed for the better the later the game has gotten in terms of putting the leadoff hitter aboard. 
none of them in the first seven innings, but the leadoff man has reached in two of the last three. I'm out. Seven time All Star hit 32 home runs during the regular season. They're trying to lead the Rays in a come from behind fashion in just their second ever extra innings game in franchise history. Postseason franchise history, of course. We already talked about that 2008 ALCS between these two teams. Tampa's only previous extra innings game in the postseason happened in that set. And Cruz slugs a high fly ball into center field for Kike Hernandez. For Yandy Diaz, who's 0 for 2 so far in this game. Began the night as a non starter. G Man Choice started the game at first base. Margo's running and he got a big jump. It's fouled away. Wow. Only wish if Diaz could have seen that, but tough to make that. Call out of the corner. Yeah, what a huge jump. Yeah. Traditionally, a good curveball hitter is Yandi. Margo stays put this time, and it's 0 and 2 to Diaz. So we've seen the fastballs at the top of the zone. Zarena waiting on deck. Oh boy, it looked like Yandi was fooled that time. Turns into a good take. Yeah, ball ball started pretty high. You see the late break, top of the zone easily, above the strike zone. One two picks. I got it. Oh, it's close. Oh, that was real close. Yeah. <laughs> you got one up here a number of years yeah, ago. Yeah, I don't you? want to relive that one. I, I, I know it wasn't a comfortable place no, that no, it no, no. hit you, but I got boxed out by my <laughs> Brian Anderson. <laughs> yeah, kind of deked me a little right. bit. At least that's the story I'm going with. He's still snickering <laughs> as he gets ready for Game Three of the Giants and Dodgers on TBS. Still the ball and two strikes to Yandy Diaz. You know, because, and we talked about this earlier, it just felt like the Rays had nothing going. They've taken advantage of the few opportunities that they've had tonight. And it stands in line with the regular season, where not only did these two teams come back more than any other teams in baseball, but the Rays had the highest percentage of their base runners score. During the regular season, a little closer at first base that time, and it doesn't sound like a huge number, but almost 17 percent of Tampa's runners ended up scoring, and that yeah. was the highest total in the game. Another throw to first. 
Well again the way this game is played out the resources used on the Rays end is very costly if they don't win the game. I mean they poured in all of their resources to win this game because they're going to have to use a bullpen game tomorrow. Now by the looks of it we'll see which direction that Alex goes now that Pavetta's in the game. There goes Margo again and Diaz sends a fly ball to left for out number two. Margo returns to first base. So now Randy Rosarena, who's two out, doubled in the eighth inning, tied it at four. The guy who seems to step up the biggest in the tightest of moments. It's kind of an awkward pass at a fastball there. Well he was in between but also that's that kryptonite area right I mean he loves to get his hands extended he's got quick hands lightning quick hands but you see there's no way to pull the barrel of the bat in on a pitch that's inside when you pitch him inside he has not had much success even if you get him out of way it just changes his whole approach He's been terrific in the postseason in his brief time in the big leagues. Of course, a record setting postseason last year. And in game one of this series, became the first player in postseason history to homer and steal home in the same game. The homer came off of Nick Pavetta. Yep. Margo runs. Throw down to second base. Not close. But Margo came off the bag. Oh, Manny Margo had that one stolen, but he slid off the bag. And the Red Sox will get another chance to walk it off. Wow, was that close. Check it. They are going to take another look. This, I mean, if if ever there was a time to use your review, I think he's safe, John. Yeah. I think he got the foot back on the bag. So the key is going to be: Does he get the tag on the shoe while it was up in the air? I mean, this is a difference of like a spike, he's, right? He's safe there, and it looked like he tried to move his leg back, which gave the appearance. That he had come off the bag. So watch this part right here. Does he get the cleat while it bounces up right there? And was he off the bag? And did he get back and get it in time? And I'm I'm under the impression no, but we haven't seen all the angles. And remember again, the call is he's out. The glove doesn't get to him until there. Right. And you're right uh, until all the angles are exercised I don't know that I even have a thought here. So that bounce right there oh, if man, he doesn't get tough. him on that bounce then it looks like yeah. he's safe. Yeah. Fargo was looking to run that entire plate appearance. He stole two bases in the World Series last year. A replay. Review powered by Mitel. Quick decision. And the call is upheld. To the bottom of the 10th inning in game three. Still tied for a piece. And this has been a terrific ball game. A 4 4 tie. To the bottom of the 10th inning we go. And David Robertson becomes the eighth Ray to pitch in this one. He and JT Shagwa, who Pitched a scoreless inning in two thirds, setting this moment up 
have now appeared in all three games of the series. And Robertson will have to go through the teeth of the Boston lineup here in the 10th. Bogarts, Verdugo, Martinez. Strike one. And these fans have been using their hamstrings the last three innings. Because that's all they've been doing is standing. It has been with every pitch intense and they are ready to erupt. You gotta use your hamstrings to stand, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I followed you there. I was just thinking about my own, which <laughs> has been rather inactive for the last 18 or so months. Seasonably cool on this night in October. A warm afternoon here in Boston. Just a fantastic ball game. A ball and two strikes now. The count on Bogarts, who has walked in four turns at the plate. For David Robertson, he appeared in game two of the series on Friday night in St. Pete, pitched around a two out double, and ended up working a scoreless sixth inning. He has been through these postseason fires before, as you can see. Broken back ground ball for Franco. One away in the bottom of the tenth. Lysol Pro Solutions is helping to keep these businesses in the game. Imagine what it can do for yours. Lysol, a trusted standard for protection. There's Alex Verdugo now. He's been held hitless tonight after a four for nine start to the series in the two games in Tampa. And this is where again the pressure on the pitchers of course in a tie game but the pressure is because that wall and you want it you want the hitters to hit to the biggest part of the park right now when one swing can win the game you don't want it over the green monster. The strike to Verdugo. The fact that each team has gone deep into its bullpen really makes tomorrow's game fascinating and if you're looking for starter candidates on the Red Sox side it all signs point to Martin Perez Kenny do you have any insights on that well we all thought it was Pavetta right yeah Martin Perez would be one possibility keep in mind Eduardo Rodriguez on short rest he pitched one and two thirds innings in game one sale one inning in game two. I don't know how much confidence the Red Sox can have in either right now. Ball and two strikes. Those initials TBD have appeared on the Rays press notes all year long. Forty one pitchers used this year. That's a lot. That got him 100 wins in the regular season. Now the question will be can it get him a deep run with the amount of relievers that have been used. They let all of baseball in innings. The innings out of the relievers which is really rare. Two balls and two strikes. Been quite a year for David Robertson. A free agent to start the season. Went to Tokyo and won a silver medal with Team USA. Pitched in the Olympics. Veteran right hander trying to keep it tied to send the game to the 11th. And Verdugo has an opposite field base hit. See, that's just great hitting, and that's that's passing the baton on. What I mean by that is 
not trying to just win it taking what the pitch was and going where the pitch was thrown to you and getting a hit on what would really be a considered a pretty good pitch outside part of the plate. Quiet keep his hands back. Winning run is on base with one away in the 10th. The Red Sox have just been unbelievable in terms of their two strike success at the plate. 16 two strike hits. Yeah that's that's again that's a byproduct of a roster they put together. It's why year in and year out when they have been in the postseason they've made pitchers pay. Owen won the count to J.D. Martinez. A lot of it has to do with the influence of this guy. Once he got here, everyone thought, oh, his power numbers are going to go down. Look at right field. That's huge. He's a great opposite field hitter. Well, they haven't gone down. And the influence that he's had throughout the lineup in the organization for in helping so many other players kind of with their philosophy of hitting, whether it's drills, whether it's what to do with two strikes. Something that uh, hitting coach Tim Hires, who you saw a moment ago there with Alex Cora, has talked about a lot in his time here that the JD Martinez influence. Tim's had a lot of success here. A ball and a strike. Hunter Renfro waits on deck, one out, one on. Ball and two strikes. Really good pitch. Now, of course, everybody knows if he hits the ball on the ground and it's at somebody, it's a double play. That's what Robertson's trying to get. It's a ground ball. Good block by Zanino. You know the importance of a game three when a five game series is tied at one apiece is clear right it's a swing game it's crucial but since 2013 the winner of game threes in a best of five that start tied one apiece have claimed only 54 percent of those series a little better than half I just suspect that in this particular series the game three winner it's going to be different because both pitching staffs are going to be a little messy heading into game four. Yeah, absolutely. So while history says it's not a big deal, I just think it's going to be a really big deal in this set. Tomorrow for the Rays, you could start wondering about starting candidates. Would they bring Michael Walker back to start tomorrow? He's certainly going to be in the discussion. Still two and two to J.D. Martinez. Nine and a half. Tomorrow. Pitch pitchers used? No. Okay. Nine and a half batters. If you had to guess if somebody would face nine and a half batters tomorrow. Probably not. If a starter will face nine and a half? Yeah. yeah. Martinez sends a fly ball into shallow right long run for Margo he sells out can't get there. Wow what a great effort. Into no man's land in foul territory and J.D. gets another chance. Yeah he had to come a long way. Such a unique field and if you're playing right field you could play center field most places because you got to come a long way. With all that room, and then know that the shallow foul territory gets quick to that tarp. He covered 118 feet in that sprint and needed maybe two and a half more. Yeah. Well, one thing, you, if you can't turn a double play, you want to trade base runners if you're the race. Yeah. Verdugo runs well. Martinez is hobbled. 
I've already be, I'd already be thinking if I was an infielder and a soft liner I'm letting it drop. Getting the force out at second. And there's all the pitches there. Everything that um, he throws cuts. Robertson throws. I don't think he throws anything straight. Of course, under the influence of uh, Mariano Rivera with the Yankees, so I'm sure he had some nice. Fouled off in the other direction. This one out of play. Save Margo the run. Martinez has the ability to end it with one swing. One of the five Red Sox hitters with 20 or more homers and at least 75 runs batted in this season. He's fighting off some pretty good pitches and getting a chance to see a lot of them. Well hit out to center field. Kiermeyer's got it for out number two. There's nothing like the crowd <laughs> roaring when you know it's close. They've seen a bunch of games here, and he just misses about seven to ten feet of this ball. Verdugo did a nice job. He was standing at second base because at this ballpark, outfielders have been known to deke when they know the ball can't be caught because of the wall. So you can't necessarily watch the outfielders. You gotta you gotta try to keep your keep your eye on the ball to see it that it's gonna bounce off the wall and the game would have been over. So two gone. Verdugo still at first base as the potential winning run, and it'll be Hunter Renfro, who singled twice and walked. It's tempting not to think about how either manager is going to find additional outs tonight. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much longer the Rays would go with Robertson if he's kind of a one-inning guy at this stage of his career. If he could go multiple innings. I think in a postseason game he'd tell you that he could. The eighth Ray to pitch in the game tonight. And again, a, a couple of these guys have gone in all three games in the series. Yes, there was a travel day in between games two and three, but that's a lot of work. And Renfro pops it in the infield, likely sending us to an 11th inning tonight. Game three is still a 4 4 tie. Packed house at Fenway for game three, and nobody's going home. Randy Arozarena leads off the top half of inning number right. 11. Back to work against Nick Pavetta. This was the matchup when Manuel Margo was caught stealing to end the top of the 10th. So we talked about a Rosarena's game one homer came against Pavetta. Back to work against him. The 0 1 pitch misses low, ball and a strike. You can see a Rosarena was visibly upset missing that first pitch that he normally swings at. Oh, it's outside. Breaking ball misses two and one. He was ready to. Yeah. <laughs> he was saying that's the pitch I homered on a couple of nights ago. Another breaking ball fouled away, and it's two and two.
A lot of names on the pitching box score on both sides. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The Red Sox can let Pavetta go. They've got lengthier with their current name on the box score. The next 2 2 to a Rose Arena. Back to back fastballs fill the count. Kenny, it is interesting to play the guessing game as to who's next if needed leading into tomorrow night. It is. And for Tampa Bay, keep in mind, Colin McHugh has not pitched in this game. Luis Patino, the rookie, has not pitched in this game. They will be key pitchers tomorrow night. And a Rosarena waits out a walk. That is a pretty good at bat for a guy who's really aggressive and wanting to make something happen. Now he realizes he can make something happen with his legs. This is a really good 3 2 pitch and that the reason you're throwing that pitch is you know the guy's going to swing and maybe just not enough on the plate when it left his hand. Rosarena has walked four times in the series. Another hitter who's kind of changed his stripes for the postseason. So a chance now for Kevin Kiermeyer, who's walked twice tonight. Could it be? We have our second sacrifice bunt attempt on two teams that don't bunt. I'm gonna say no for the race. I don't think they're bunting here. It, they just it's right. just not in their DNA. No. I think in the six, four were on their own. You're probably right. <laughs> it might have been all six. Probably right. Oh and one to Kevin Kiermeyer. Yeah, it's not the part of the lineup that uh, is the strongest for the Rays, so you'd think they'd get all the swings they could here. Kiermeyer sends a foul ball into the left field seats foul. Oh and two. Again, the Rays put their leadoff hitter aboard, something that didn't happen in the first seven innings of the game. But against the Boston bullpen, the Rays have put the leadoff hitter aboard in three of their last four innings. Ton of ground balls on curveballs out of Kiermaier, especially when they're away. So if you're thinking the Boston defense in a full blown shift now with two strikes. We're hoping that stat remains the same. Well, Rosarena stays put again. There's ball one on a fastball that missed. Almost looked like a pitch out pitch, but it wasn't. And it's a ball and two strikes now on Kiermeyer. Both managers low on bench options and bullpen options at this stage of the night. Top of the 11th inning tied at four. Rosa Reina again stays put. And Kiermeyer takes ball two. Now the crazy thing about this shift is let's say there's a slow grounding ball to the right side and Devers is currently going to be the one who takes the throw. But let's say the throw doesn't come there because it's too slow. A Rosa Reina can keep going to third if Devers is not on the awareness of what that play is going to be. So it's a tough scenario defensively for the Red Sox, depending on how this ball is hit. If Kiermeyer could figure out a way just to butcher boy a ball to the left side of the infield, oh, he's it, got a base hit. I mean, there is nobody home. And that's why I would think with this after fouling off that fastball that the, the, the pitch that he'll ground into that shift will be a breaking ball. The pitch he could hit the other way by mistake would be a fastball. And that would pose a problem for the Red Sox. Are you surprised that Rosarena hasn't tried to run in this plate appearance? A little bit. Meyer was trying to serve it to the left side. You could tell with that pass. Still two and two.
The Tampa Bay Rays hit into the fewest double plays this season. 75 the lowest total in Major League Baseball. Certainly trying to put it in play that way. Well, he, he's doing a couple things. He's fighting off the fastball, protecting against the breaking ball, right? So they're trying to elevate the fastball where he's weak in the zone. And you can see the target. They're trying to put it in the outside. But to what we've been talking about, that would be a much easier pit, pitch to hit the other way, even in a defensive mode, protecting with two strikes. The next 2 2. Breaking ball that time foul back and Kiermaier knows he had a shot. Yeah that breaking ball was intended to be down more and. He may be even checking to see if that curveball looked like it was going to be a strike to the umpire just to get a gauge. And it wouldn't have been. It's four straight foul balls. Well we've had some classic. At bats here. Yeah. And Christian Vasquez will go out for a visit. We just don't pay attention to mound visits during the regular season because it's not an issue. But this time of year, think of the many Jorge Posada to Andy Pettit World Series visits <laughs> of uh, not too long ago, and that was in part the prompting for the mound visit rule. Each side gets more when a game goes to extra innings. Still two and two to Kiermaier. This will be the tenth pitch of the at bat to Kevin Kiermaier. Prior to this plate appearance, he saw a total of 10, 13 pitches rather, in his first four plate appearances combined. Kevin Cash told us before the game that they'll put green and red lights out there. If a guy thinks he has a base with a green light, he's on his own to run. And I don't know if a Rosarena has a green light here and is choosing not to go, or if the traffic signal reads red for him. But he has not tried to run. Three and two might change things here. Let's see if they send him with nobody out. There he goes. And Kiermaier strikes out. Throw down to second Keep base. Third. Oh, Randy's on his way to third where it was vacant. Pavetta covers the bag and Rosarena gets back safely. Wow. But he didn't recognize it in time, right? To, to be able to get to third base, he slid in head first. That was the that was the pressure on the defense. See where Devers has got to come over, and then there's no one at third. Great job by Pavetta, and I know that Vasquez was coming, but you have all kinds of <laughs> exposed bases when you're out of position. Great job recognizing right there, though, to get back in time to keep. A runner in scoring position. It was the Johnny Damon moment from the 2009 World Series. Just keep running. And David Bush is going to come out for a visit now. The Red Sox pitching coach has been very active tonight. Mike Zanino's the batter. Go ahead runs in scoring position with one away. Randy Arozarena's second stolen base of the series. See, the, the ground ball would have been impossible. I mean, you're asking, you're asking Vasquez on the ground ball. Usually, 
he's going the other way because there's a man at third base to cover the throw to first. He would have to go to third on the ground ball. Read that right away. If they weren't able to make a force at second, just a lot of pressure on the defense in that situation. So now Mike Zanino. Zanino had a chance in the eighth after the Rays had tied it with runners at first and second and two gone and was called out on strikes. Zanino's been a click away. It, he makes he may set a record in, in one game for foul balls. <laughs> yeah. The longest plate appearance of his season, 11 pitches against Evaldi back in the second inning. Good breaking ball swung on to miss, putting him behind 0 2. Pavetta in the driver's seat here. Jordan Luplo waits on deck. 0 2 pitch. Tried to make him chase that same offering that turned into an easy take. Yeah. That's the thing about making back to back breaking balls. You want them in the same area to really put the pressure. You don't want to ever reset a hitter by seeing one good one, two bad ones, and now he's seen three. Zanini is a pretty good fastball hitter. Pavetta got the better of him there. Slowed him down with the breaking ball, sped him up with the fastball, and dotted it up. Jordan Luplo now with two away. Luplo walked as a pinch hitter in the seventh and then struck out. Did you see what I just saw? Martin Perez is up in the bullpen for Boston. Yeah, he's just getting a side session in for tomorrow. <laughs> Before making his start in less than 24 hours. Oh, man, if he gets into the game, you know, there's no telling what we're going to see tomorrow in game four. This is back to back innings that the Rays have had the leadoff hitter aboard. Oh, and two. I'll tell you what, Pavetta's been unbelievable. I mean, he's dialed up his fastball, and it's got tremendous backspin and carry. When hitters are swinging through that pitch, tells you he's behind it. Two strikes. Well out of play. We go to the bottom of the eleventh. Boston will have Vasquez, Arroyo, and Dahlbeck. And if somebody gets on base, Kike Hernandez would have a chance. Still the ball and two strikes. Lead off 
Tough walk. Three straight strikeouts and a still 4-4 tie. Four tie in game three as we go to the bottom half of inning number 11. A number of fascinating and entertaining twists and turns along the way. Ray's bullpen has held up splendidly in game three after a clunker on Friday night. And David Robertson continues. He faces the eight, nine, and top of the order Boston batters Christian Vasquez, Christian Arroyo, and Bobby Dahlbeck. Strike. I know one thing, Matty. You'd rather be in this ball game than watching this ball game. This is the worst way to watch a game if you're a current player and you have no impact. You'd actually rather be part of the action to know you have some kind of impact. Watching is just it's difficult. Ball and two strikes. Martin Perez had been up in the Red Sox bullpen. Uh, the way Pavetta is going another inning or even more is certainly not out of the question. Threw a couple of really good curveballs to strike out three batters and strand that leadoff runner. Robertson's one two. How about the last pitch that Nick Pavetta threw to finish up the regular season. You got Juan Soto looking at a big yacker. And then got Luplo on the same pitch a moment ago. Knuckle curveball. Both were important. But which one would be the most. One and two to Vasquez. Into center field for Kiermeyer, who runs it down. Boy, Kevin Kiermeyer has been terrific tonight. He made a catch on a sinking liner off the bat of Alex Verdugo in the eighth that had a 25% catch probability attached to it. And that was another less than routine chance. Both center fielders have been outstanding. He watched the jump that he gets, and he's always in the right spot, reading the ball off the bat. Positioning's one thing, but it's the reaction you have. When the ball has struck and you've got to read it immediately off of contact, and he does it as good as anybody. Oh, Christian Arroyo, he's got two singles on his line tonight. Three for 13 so far in the series. Four runs on eight hits for Tampa, four runs on 13 hits, and an error for the Red Sox. One and one. There has been a big difference tonight in productivity at the bottom of the order. The Red Sox, seven through nine hitters, have been very productive. Same cannot be said for the Rays. Ooh, man. Talk about knuckle curveballs. He's got a tight one, too, but he throws it from a different angle. Pavetta taller throws it more north and south. He'll get around and throw it east and west and, and be able to spin it in a different way. It's been an abbreviated body of work for David Robertson, as we talked about. Wasn't signed until late in the season. His longest outing of the year as a Ray has been just two innings. Shook Zanino off twice. Here's the 2 2, and it's fouled away again. 
Bobby Dahlbeck next. It would be his first plate appearance of the game. He came on as a pinch runner earlier. He's got the power to end it with one swing. This is what we're talking about bottom of the lineups. Rays just one for 12 with eight strikeouts. Well it helps when. The longer your lineup goes like the Red Sox you got J.D. Martinez batting sixth. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good point. <clears throat> two two. Into the left field corner. Arroyo into second base. The winning run in scoring position with one gone. Well that breaking ball he got around it and it rolled you're going to see it start on the inside part of the plate and watch how it just rolls right there over the middle gets on top of it pulls it down the line easy double and stress once again. Snyder back out for a discussion with David Robertson. Bobby Dahlbeck, the batter. Kike Hernandez would bat next. Just a little stalling here, too, going on, maybe to give the reliever in the race bullpen an opportunity to kind of get revved up. Luis Patino was to be saved for tomorrow. <laughs> Said this a couple of times on both sides. The right now is much more important for Kevin Cash. Colin McHugh had been up for a moment and then they switched. So it's Patino up. Bobby Dahlbeck has a chance to win it for the Red Sox. Strike one. Dahlbeck has played in each of the Sox first three postseason games this year. Including a couple of starts at first base. End of the regular season in fine form. Twenty five of his last thirty five hits were of the extra base hit variety including fourteen homers. There have been opportunities on both sides that have been uncashed. Oh, and two to Dahlbeck. Got him. Wow, what a that's an adjustment right there. I mean, he just threw one that gave up a double and then started that one again on a perfect height of the fastball that he got strike one with. That is tight and that is tough to lay off of. So now Kike Hernandez. Kike had a chance to win it in the bottom of the ninth. A runner on base, Hernandez struck out. He has been huge the last two games. 17 total bases in games two and three combined. And he's been aggressively offering at the first pitch of an at bat all night. And again, I know, again, everyone has the information readily available. But if he's going to beat you, he has to beat you to right field. His strength is center to left center because he's looking to pull the ball, and anything away he will pull off possibly. 
Robertson's 0 1. To shortstop. Franco backhands it and gets a perfect wow. throw off to first. He made that play look way too easy. A fine play by Jordan Luplo with the bag at first base. A highlight real play on both ends to send it to the 12th inning. Still tied at four. In no small part to this great play by Wander Franco and a perhaps even better play by Jordan Luplo at first. And Kenny, we're reminded of the relative inexperience by both of those players. That's right, Matt. Luplo had not even played first base until he was traded to the Rays at the deadline. And Franco, there are evaluators who believe he ultimately will end up at second or third, but he has shown improvement even during his brief time in the majors. Joey Wendell, his third baseman, said Franco's become more aggressive, wanting the ball, commanding the position. We've certainly seen that tonight. 0 oh 1 the count to Brandon Lau, top of the order here for Tampa. Make it 0 oh 2. I mean, the job that these last two pitchers have done, Pavetta and Robertson, has been incredible. Pavetta came on in the 10th. He has allowed the leadoff hitter to reach in both of his innings. Oh, no. Boy, they say that Lau pulled back. Pavetta's hot. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think he has. I think he has a good point. Oh, he bunted at that. That's an attempt for me. Rays catch a break for the time being. I think he surprised everybody right there by even bunting. The Even, umpires and everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think so too. And Owen two pitch to a guy who hit 39 homers and he squared around bunt. Just tells you what he thinks of the fastball. Part of it is he's also trying to get out of the way, but he squares around and you can see the barrel of the bat go down. And then he sells it by trying to say that that was just getting out of the way. Ball and two strikes to Brandon Lau. Got him anyway. And 0 for 6 night for the Rays leadoff hitter. Well, Pavetta. This was a huge inning. And on second, he went to another level and struck out the three guys. Now four. His last four have been outs, have been strikeouts. Here's Wander Franco now. He has homered and singled tonight. These are like 17 strikeouts for the Rays. Something like that. You want to go with something Her. like that, or you want, you want yeah. the actual number? You know me. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the number here. Hang on. Um, I think it is 17. 17. Yeah. yeah. Franco sends the ball out to center field. Routine for Kike Hernandez. Two away. See, this is the part where the longer that Pavetta can stay in the game, he's in rhythm. You feel good about what he's doing. The Rays are going to have to make a change because I don't think Robertson can keep going. Well, they had Patino up. Robertson just finished his longest appearance of the year, if in fact it is finished. And here's Margo now with two away and the base is empty. You go back to the curveball there. Yep. That was the, the pitch that Margo singled on. 
when Pavetta was inserted into the ball game in the tenth. Back to back, that was a big one. He's rolling. And what I love is he's on the mound ready to go. He's in attack mode with every pitch. Oh, and two to Manny Margo. Just tipped. And judging by the way Vasquez reacted, it might have got him in the fingers. Got somebody. Man, catchers take a beating. Try to get your hand behind your body, but it catches his forearm. And right now, with the cool temperatures, I'm sure he's got trying to just get the tingle out, but. You may have heard Sam Holbrook went out and mentioned to Pavetta that hey that got him pretty good as if to indicate give him a sec. Well, he didn't need it. He is rolling. That hammer is heavy tonight. Five strikeouts in three scoreless relief innings by Nick Pavetta. Here for Tampa Bay. Their ninth of the game guy who we thought had a chance to start game four those plans have blown up it'll be Luis Patino here in the 12th. Four pitch mix. 95 fastball. Wow. Big time velo and a swing and a miss by Devers who the Rays have. Peppered with fastballs all night. Upstairs has got no chance and I and, and I know it's hard to see well, why can't you just stay off that pitch it's easier said than done you're human you want to make a good swing try to end the game or get on base. Oh and two just clearly not right when that hand falls off the swing as it does and he's doing his best to disguise his discomfort but it's obvious that he's not right tonight. I mean, should we expect anything different than fastballs here? No. Ooh, oh, right wow. back to Patino on a sharp hop. Only one extra innings game in postseason history has gone longer than the one we're watching tonight. Can win it. Damon, the lead runner at second. Ortiz fights it off center field. Damon running. And he can keep on running to New York. Game six tomorrow night. Yeah, part of that legendary comeback for the Red Sox, the 04 ALCS against the Yankees, in which they fell behind 0 to 3 and came back to win. That's the only postseason game longer than the one we're involved with here. This would be the guy I'd be most nervous about. They've kept him at bay. Patino's going to get him on a first pitch pop up if Zanino can find a tough play for a catcher. Zanino makes it no problem. Wow, rare night when you think about Bogarts and how locked in he's been to get him out five times. He's doing something. Here's Alex Verdugo. It looked like Verdugo's one out base hit in the bottom of the 10th was going to set the Red Sox up for a walk off win. And then David Martinez went on to retire J.D. Martinez. David Robertson that is retired J.D. Martinez and Hunter Renfro. Dave Martinez is the manager of the Nationals and he's home tonight. Into center field routine for Kiermaier. Let's play 13. 
kind of liking a man on second, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Still tied at four. On to the 13th. Nick Pavetta All continues. Right. He faces Nelson Cruz. Yandy Diaz and Randy Arozarena. Three scoreless innings for Pavetta since entering the game in the top of the tenth. He's got Nelly Cruz behind 0 and 2. I'm trying to think where the Red Sox would be without Hauk and Pavetta. Incredible job. Hauk was terrific in game two, gobbling up bulk innings. Same set of Pavetta tonight. Oh, that's upside. Entering the postseason, Nick Pavetta's longest relief outing was three and two thirds. In game one, he went four and two thirds and is trying to give the Red Sox another four inning performance tonight. You can't throw another one of those. That one hung a little too long. And when you've slowed the hitter down and a great hitter like Cruz, the tendency is to think, okay, now speed him up. Speed him up with a fastball. I just slowed him down. He fouled it off. Let's see what they go to. One ball and two strikes to Nelson Cruz, who's been limited to just a single tonight in his five at bats. He did it. Three strikeouts tonight on his line. One away. I haven't seen a lot of Nick Pavetta starts this year, but I'd be hard pressed to think he's had a better fastball. And maybe the relief roll just kind of an adrenaline of the postseason has gotten his fastball up a tick. He has struck out six of the last seven rays that he's faced. And now it's Yandy Diaz who serves a base hit into the opposite field. That ends the stretch of seven in a row retired by Pavetta and it gives a Rosarena a chance with a man on base. Zarena with a drive out to left field. Verdugo on it to make the catch. There was just enough off that pitch to take the sting out of a Rosarena's bat. I'm trying to think the last time someone's touched third base or even been on third base. It's been a while. Well, for the, for the Rays, it was when they scored the two runs in the eighth. Well, I warned you against making me look at my scorecard. It is a disaster. For the Red Sox, the last time they had a runner at third base was when Kike hit the homer in the fifth. It's been a long time. <laughs> you were right. One to know to Kevin Kiermeyer. Oh. The last Red Sox reliever with four or more scoreless innings of relief in a playoff game was David Price in game three of the 2017 ALDS. In fact, only four Red Sox pitchers have ever done it. Four scoreless innings in relief in the postseason. Same game. Same game. No, it, the, the four innings oh. in the same game. Yeah. No. <laughs> I was just saying, man. That game would be <laughs> harder to call than this one. Oh.
Just saw a moment ago he passed the five hour mark. All right, you're the manager. 3 0. Take. Green light go. Green light go. How about you? I'm going to take him. Hurt. Which he does. Three balls and a strike. Chances are, whatever you get 3 1, you're going to get 3 0, you're going to get 3 1. Well, Mike Zanino on deck. He struck out three times in this game. And a full count now. Well, with the outfield plan, no doubles, at least the Rays are going to get the runner to go on the pitch, which would help a little bit. You remember how we were talking about the Rays doing a really good job when they get base runners? They are two for 21 in this game with runners on base. He has runs. Kiermeyer sends a ball into right center field. That's trouble. And that one's off the base of the wall. Diaz coming around to score. Kiermeyer to third. The Rays have taken the lead. They're saying that's going to be a double. That is a horrible break and the runner oh. was going. I was just saying that the runner going allows them to score on a double. I think they might. They're going to take the, a look. At the, that hit the top of the wall and go over. They're not only going to look at that. Isn't it umpire's discretion as to where to place the base runner. I'm going to get another look at what, what that ball hit. But get, but starting the runner was the only chance you were going to score playing no doubles. This ball hits. Wow, that was a ton of spin. It hits before the wall, down, and hits the minute. right Wait. fielder and goes over the wall. So it's an unbelievable break. It's being discussed now with Kevin Cash the fact uh -uh. that it hit Renfro and bounced over the wall. Be honest, I, I don't know that I've ever seen this, and I don't know how this I don't know can how be, how can it's be scored. a ground rule double. I don't know how it's scored, and I don't know how you place the base runner. I know that there is umpire's discretion that comes into play here. They're going to conference on this with New York. They have to, because a ball that bounces without anybody touching it, or let's say a fan touches, automatic ground rule double. It's like if you're hit if you if you turn a fly ball and hits your head and goes over the wall it's a homer. But I don't know that that could apply with a ball that hits the wall comes back hits you and then goes over the wall. I mean D Diaz scores on that ball easily. Yeah. E even if there's a play made and the ball stays in play. Wow. All right here we go. And they're saying it's a double. Are they going to put Diaz back on base? That is amazing That's, break. They are. Oh my goodness. That is that could be one of the greatest breaks in postseason ever. Well, well there'll be a new rule about that next year. I guarantee you. I mean, if that's what cost the Tampa Bay Rays their postseason. It is a ground rule double and Diaz is being put back on base. So it's going to take three hits or some combination of pass ball wild pitch to get that run in. Wow. I mean, you think you've seen a lot of things? I, I've never seen that. I, that. I've never seen it. And the right field here is so big. Well, here we go. It's going to be up to Mike Zanino now. Kevin Kiermeyer. 
hit a ball that should have delivered the Rays a one run lead. Instead, it's still a 4 4 tie, second and third with two gone. A lot of pressure on Vasquez. Real good at bl blocking curveballs in the dirt. You know that what Pavetta wants to do at some point, if he can, bounce a curveball to get a strike three or a swing and a miss. So with the runner on third, a lot of pressure on your catcher. By the way, that double by Kiermaier is the first extra base hit by a Ray in a postseason game. In extra innings, that is. Oh, and two to Zanino. <laughs> I'm still wrapping my arms around that plate. I think that's going to have to be addressed in next year's version of the rule book. Renfro tried to steal it over the fence when he hit it. He knew he hit it. Incredible break. That's amazing. Through all that, a scoreless inning posted by Profeta and a still 4 4 ball game. Kevin Kiermeyer hit a ball that should have delivered the Tampa Bay Rays an extra innings lead. Instead, a fluky play in the outfield. In which the ball bounded off the fence and then against a fielder and then over the fence resulted in a ground rule double call, which brought a scoring run back to third, where eventually Nick Pavetta got a strikeout to end the jam. And a short fence at that. Most fences that wouldn't even have gone off. JD Martinez sends the ball out near the same direction. This one's playable for Kiermeyer, and there's one away in the bottom of the 13th. If you think about the normal uh, height of a fence, right? It may not even gone over a normal fence, so it, it had the perfect storm. I mean, this ball, the runner's already halfway between seconds, so you know he's going to score. The ball bounces and hits him and goes over the fence for what now is going to be a incredible. Play if the Red Sox can win it. Kenny, you saw it from the field level. Well, I got the explanation from Major League Baseball on the ruling, and it's this a ball deflected by a player out of play is a ground rule double. So there it is. The ball retains its status as a batted ball until it is fielded cleanly by a defensive player. So that is the same as if the ball had naturally bounced over the fence. That's the explanation. Wow. All right. There it is, right out of the rule book. Right from Major League Baseball to, to Kenny to you at home. It's a ball and a strike to Hunter Renfro. You get the sense in these extra innings postseason games, and John, you and I have done a lot of them, and a lot of long ones, that it doesn't end until somebody on the home side hits a home run. Yeah I mean everyone not everyone in this game has been trying to hit a home run but it seems like the majority of extra inning games that's what happens especially in the regular season postseason it just gets exaggerated. Oh. I mean remembering game three of the 2018 World Series between the Dodgers and the Red Sox there was that crazy play involving Ian Kinsler that might have ended the game earlier and it didn't end until the 18th inning when Max Muncy hit the walk off dinger. Yeah. I mean if the Rays can't score a run. Based on the weirdness we saw in the. The top of this inning. Full count three balls and two strikes. And there's ball four. Renfro's aboard. What a strange role he has played in the proceedings tonight. 
been on base all night. First of all, two walks, two singles. But he was the outfielder that had that ball bounce off the fence and then off his body over the wall. Well, here we go with catcher Christian Vasquez having a chance. There have been seven walk off homers by a catcher in postseason history. Do I hear number eight? writers in the world wouldn't have been able to come up with this script. Unbelievable game will be talked about for a long time. It'll be talked about for a very long time if the Boston Red Sox go on to win this series in advance and keep going and who knows how long but this game was filled with a lot of great pitchers and then this one swing. I mean they're already starting the uh, team of destiny chance here in Boston to win a game under these circumstances. The wild events of the top of the.